Okay, you were married in 1936, right? Yeah. No, seven. 37. Okay, so you were drafted not too long after that then. You were, you were, you were at the news, you were working yeah. at the news. Doing what? Printing, uh, and I was working nights the night of the draft when they drew the numbers out of the fishbowl. <laughs> so you had first word here. 157. Third number drawn and it was me. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, all through the country we ever had 157. Boy, I'm telling you. Well, can you imagine that it, it, I could take tickets on a lottery forever, <laughs> never hit nothing. Here I am, the third number out of the bowl of a whole country. That was, that was what, 1940? 41 they did the draft? Uh, After Pearl Harbor. Yeah, 1942. 42. Well, right of eight, you know. Did, did anybody here pay any attention to 1939 when, when Germany invaded Poland? Not mm -hmm. so much that I know of. It was just another event in the world, right? Yeah. So really well, nothing I, been, you know, all the other events going on. Yeah. So really the first thing was Pearl Harbor that got everybody fired up. Uh, the big thing here then was uh, defense, supply of, you know. Oh yeah, the British uh, one lease. Defense, yeah. Uh, and, you know, these airplane factories and all that stuff. So the rest of the guys probably got on you when your number came up, right? Lucky oh, bull. Oh, jeez, yeah. <clears throat> but luckily, <clears throat> you know, it was a while before I got called. And then, you know, when I, when they, uh, I got crashed, uh, uh, really, I got called in June, uh, 42. No. I, what is it? I forgot which year. Well, anyhow, June, so we had to go down and get the physical, you know. And this is what I got me in the beginning, is the politics. I went up to, had to go to a, on Genesee Street to a doctor for the blood test, first thing. Okay, I went, and this guy was in there, too. And he was town attorney out here. Looked like he played football in college, you know. Big strapping guy, picture of health. And we'd get their blood test and come back. I'll be damned. He never went to war. He never got called. Well, you talk politics. And I, like a jackass, he lived over on, on uh, Andrew. I went to him uh, before I, I left and, and had a will made out and the power of attorney for your mother and all that stuff, you know. Not knowing at the time that he ain't going to go, but he never went. And here I am, you know. Well, it was quite a squabble. Uh, Rapid was on the board. His son, and uh, across the street was Leaders, which was related to my aunt, you know. And uh, Normie never went. Oh, he went eventually, because if we get Pine Hill, there was quite a squabble about these guys not going. They were young single guys, you know. And here you know, you're taking the married guys. So, uh, well, you, in, what, 1942, you would have been how old? I was uh, 31. 31 and married. Yeah. And you still, still... And here I'm going to the lottery 17, 18, you know. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it was something because uh, we had to go up to the uh, federal building, and which was on the corner of... Uh, uh, what's it? Second one, Swan Street. No, what's the second one? Swan and uh, sure. Ellicott. Ellicott. Okay. All right. So we go up there to physical, and uh, the one guy, the one old doctor, he probably wouldn't have passed me. He wouldn't pass me. He wouldn't have passed me. But he was about after so many other ones. Each one was a specialist, like you know. And I think it was just you're warm, you're breathing. Okay. And I came and, you know, and he had to turn around and walk and he was shaking his head. I had miracles veins. And he didn't think I should, you know, be in. But of course, all the other ones, they're younger doctors, and bing, 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 and you're through. So when you get all done, <clears throat> they wanted, I, when I left home, I didn't know where I was going to be, actually. And I said to your mother, finally, my uncle kept saying, 
take the Coast Guard. He was in the Coast Guard during World War I, see. He says, you'll have a clean bed to sleep in and decent eats. And which, I, which uncle was that, was it? Huh? Who was that one? Uncle, uncle John. John. Uncle Trent's. Yeah, okay, I remember him. And, uh, and then I got up there, and I went with this Parisi out here. His father was a contractor. And uh, Joe Lights and Earl Lane, and they're all from Pine Hill here. And uh, so they're all together, you know, being from Chicktawaggy, they're stuck Pine Hill, they're stuck together. And uh, they, they said that they're going to take the army. And they, I, I told your mother when I left, I said, I think I'll take the army so you know where I am. Because I didn't know whether I was going to come home or not, you know. And uh, I got up there, and this guy from the Navy, he was talking and talking to me and talking to me. And I kept saying, yeah, but that land is so far down from the water up on top. <laughs> well, you got, you got to your brother, right? You <laughs> well, no, I, <laughs> I told him to go. I told other ones to go. I don't, don't get into the damn army, you know. <laughs> And uh, Harold went to, then he, when he got called, and Ernie, they all went into the Navy. And uh, four doors down, there was a young kid, Carolina, you know, from the, the, the uh, Del Prince Paving, he's married to one of the girls. He, his father kept writing to me, you know, and he says about him, he wanted to, uh, to enlist. He wasn't old enough. His father would have to sign, you know. And how much problem they were having with him, you know. And so I wrote him a long letter. And I told him, you know, never mind the flag waving or the band playing. Just wait until you got to go. Don't go ahead. And don't get in the army. <laughs> so eventually, when he became, just before he became a Bates, he went down there and they signed in. And he took the Navy. Well, he hit it nice. He went down to the uh, Virgin Islands and he never oh. went anywhere, you know. <laughs> so it was a lucky break for him. So, uh, but when I got out of the says, we took the whole examination and we had to go over to the Hotel Buffalo. And that's where they fed us. I learned there, quick, when you're in the Army, move, Barry, move. <laughs> I stood there watching, should I take white milk or should I take chocolate milk? By the time I made my mind up, the chocolate milk was gone. <laughs> Everybody grabbed it, though. So grab first and change your mind later. And uh, then they, they took us back, swore us in, and then they says, you want to take your furlough now or later? And I thought, I don't trust nobody no more. I'll take my furlough right now. So I have two weeks. And I went home, and so they gave me my two weeks. I was into the Army in June, but I didn't have to report until July 5th. That way, see? Because when I came back, when I went through training, I didn't get no training. Furlough home. <laughs> well, even when I got down the other camps, I never got a furlough, and I don't think anybody else that voted for take it later did either. So what I, what I did get is a, a GLA and Rugan home. See, because we were coming from South Carolina, we went to Washington, Washington to Baltimore, and then I came home, and uh, that was for Thanksgiving, and then went back to Camp Meade. And we went to uh, Orangeburg. Carolina was Camp Croft, right? That was Camp Croft in South Carolina. Yeah. And that was where you went on July 5th? Yeah. Well, no, from the, when we left Buffalo, we went out to the town hall, loaded on, on buses, and they took us downtown to the Pennsylvania Railroad Station. Well, it was a Lehigh Station, the Pennsylvania train loaded us on that. We went from and it's the first time in my life I ever read tongue. On the train, that's what they serve for dinner, tongue. <laughs> oh, and uh, 
and we rode all along and went from there to Albany and Albany down. You'd be done the route. But that was the central. And uh, got down to New York, you know, and that was funny when you came into the Grand Central Station. And they, they said, now, when the train stops and the doors open, everybody run over and against the wall. It was a keep the killers. <laughs> we run around we against the wall. Well, we went around the corner and they had a whole restaurant. It was closed, but it was, you know, they had it arranged to feed us. So they all fed us. Well, at that time, it was blackout along the coast. So then they took us uh, to uh, oh, some kind of rapid transit. And then they took us on to this train. And the train went along to Long Island, but it was curtains down and lights out and all that stuff, you know. And we went to Camp Shanks. And we stood there, uh, well, not a week, I guess. But I learned there too, boy. <laughs> I'm learning fast. <laughs> this was one of the camps where you're just waiting to get puts, you know. But they always got to give you details so you don't sit around and think or stay idle, you know. So the one day we go out and the guys count out so many, you know. They give them to somebody and they take you somewhere. But the guy takes us out on a, a range, rifle range. He says, we got to pick weeds. So we went out there and laid on the field like this, you know, we are, we start, <laughs> never moving off the spot, just to kill the day, that's what it was. <laughs> but there, you know, we're trying to avoid KP, it was for 17 hours in the, you know, our mess, in this defense mess, so that was a long stretch. So uh, we got to go in and uh, I got caught one time on KP, but not, and they took us, what they were going to do was details. And uh, they took us down, marched us down the road to a hospital there. And they started uh, giving out pie, pails and mops and brooms, you know. We were supposed to clean up the place. Well, Earl and uh, Pete and Joe, we kept moving back back, let all these guys walk ahead of us, you know, we got out of the tail end. When they got down the tail end, they ran out of the <laughs> You did learn fast. So they thought, what are they going to do with us, you know? So they took us to the officer's quarters next to the hospital, and they put us on KP. It was, the, 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 you know, the same ones that are, there were about five of them. And what a place! I damn near died that night. I ate so much. <laughs> <laughs> Get in there and they had a chef. He was, you know, the, the officers, they had good chefs. This guy was a chef in New York City, some big hotel. And uh, we got there and he says, this is the pantry. Cookies and all cakes and stuff are in there. This is the refrigerator. And uh, there's uh, eclairs and cream puffs and cool drinks. And uh, he says, eat what you want. Well, geez, cream puffs. One, two, three. <laughs> I kept going. And we had to clean up a little bit here and to clean up a little bit there. It wasn't hardly anything to do, you know. And then they came dinner time. Uh, the, uh, he says, I'll feed you guys in a minute. So get your plates. You know, plates, no mess here. Well, the uh, commanding officer came in at dinner, so he's got this big oven and he's got a big beef roast, about that long, rolled roast, you know. So he takes out a whole bunch of them, he cut them right through the middle, find the best one, see, the commander. And he cuts them and he puts it on the plate, you know. <coughs> they serve them. Well, I, they, I guess they paid for their meals, as I understand it. Officer. So I'm standing there with my plate, you know, and he looked at me, and I says, well, if it's good enough for the general, it's good enough for me. Give me some of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he cuts off a slice and about that thick, you know, and about that size. And I said, fine. And he cuts off another one and puts it on. And he says, don't waste any. 
you know, and then the potatoes and the corn, oh, and I, gosh, and I ate and ate, and then during the afternoon we ate these pastries, you know. It came evening when we got finished and had to go back, walk back to camp. My belly was like a lead balloon. I couldn't, I, oh, I couldn't wait to get back and land the bunk. <laughs> I was so loaded. I didn't want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrific, <laughs> but that was it. So I learned how to do these things. So when we got back there, then uh, what they do is, when you're going to ship out in the morning, see, they got to go by the way the trains come in. And it was, it was luck of the draw more where you went, because they go A, B, C, D as far as they needed, you know the A's, the B's, and the C's. If they got enough of the C's, they quit. But they go all the way down the line. Next time, the next bunch. <coughs> and they fall out in the, in the morning like that, you know, and they get called for things. And then they always come around about 2 o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping, you know? And with a flashlight, and the guy would shake him. Sergeant, sign here. You don't know what the hell you can go around and sign the paper <laughs> next morning. You're out at six o'clock, you're standing with your face. <laughs> so, Earl, that was, that was where he got split. Earl and Vic and, uh, what do you call it, uh, Pete. But Earl and uh, Peter, they went to the railway battalion. And uh, they had it pretty good for a while because they were shipped them back up by the Suez Canal, I mean, uh, St. Sault Ste. Marie. And they stayed there for quite a while, then they got finally shipped over. And the other ones went into military police. Why is it? V, you know? I get it under the infantry. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was something. Luck of the draw. Yeah. So I go in. And we, and we got on a train, went to Camp Croft. And uh, like the guy said when we got there, he says, well, after you leave here, you're going to think this thing was a country club. And he was right. He had nice, white, clean, big barracks, you know, new, big service club. You, you know, at Mead was, when we went to Mead, they were tar paper shacks. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the first road course. <laughs> And we got there, and uh, the guy, the, uh, we got put in the different battalions, you know. So, okay, I got into the third battalion, and third platoon, and it went through your regular training, you know. And that was red dirt down there, you know, that whole area south of the mid red clay work. There's one time I we were out of clothes, out in the rain, you know, we come back and change, out in the rain, and come back. So we're holding classes inside the barracks, folded up the cots and stuff, you know, sitting there in our shorts. That's all we had, <laughs> all the clothes were gone, messed up. <coughs> there was something there. And then we left when we did a, went through that thing. Oh, that was a funny one there, too, one time. We had a forced march. And I'll swear, I don't know how the hell these dogs do it, but they seemed as though one outfit was going on a march. And they would come there the night before and sleep under the barracks. You know, all the barracks would pull off the ground. Next morning, sure enough, 25-mile forced march at the Logman. That's like going from one city to another, you know, we were going. <coughs> and I had a kid from Buffalo, his name was Blazewski. When you had when you, you had your helmet, you had a piece of tape up there with your name on. Well, with him, they had to put two tapes on it. <laughs> so he called him Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> he came from off of Fillmore Avenue, B Street. And uh, this March, to turn the night, he was walking in his sleep. I was holding his straps on his pack in the back, you know, his stirred up. He was sleeping and walking. 
So when we had to go, we had to go into Woodlock and back then we were supposed to make a, an attack on a line in the morning. And uh, so we pulled off into a field. And then they come along and he was about that chair and I was about here. And they said we had to disperse more, you know, get used to uh, mortar attacks, you had to be dispersed so you were in all one place. So I had to move, so I moved over the floor in the tall grass, went to sleep. And uh, next morning, you know, at daybreak, I wake up, I don't see hear nothing, no but nothing, quiet. So I get up and I walk around and look for Murph, Murphy, can't find him. <laughs> I don't know, I this in toy, I just oriented, you know, and didn't know where anybody was. Couldn't find nobody, I walking through all this big grass. Finally I thought, well, I'll stand, this is supposed to be a tactical maneuver, you know. I'll stand up, light a cigarette, sure Nick, if there's anybody around, I'm going to holler about lighting the match. <laughs> I did, nothing happened. The whole company pulled out in early morning and <laughs> Murphy knew I wasn't there and he was trying to tell the sergeant, but the sergeant said, well, we can't go back and find him. <laughs> so I, I wake up, I'm the only one out in the area and I don't know where the hell I'm at. <laughs> I start walking down the road, figured this is the way toward camp and I found three officers sleeping alongside the road there. When I come along, they woke up, see, and I asked them if any went past, anybody go by here? He said, yeah, down the road. So I started down the road and I didn't know where I'm going. Finally, I, another outfit uh, patrol, about six guys who were supposed to be on patrol came by, you know, and uh, I asked him what company they were, I don't know what it was. And I tagged along behind them. And they went up to the, where the line was formed, you know. Well, I made the dummy attack with somebody else's outfit, not ours. I couldn't find them. Every one would say they're down there, and the other would say they're here, and I don't know the hell with it, you know. <laughs> and then I, when I got done, you got to the, what the line was, I walked back to camp, and I'm sitting out in front of the barracks on the steps, you know, and in comes the company. <laughs> Sergeant, where the hell were you? <laughs> Well, then I'm getting back, and you know, at that time, we <laughs> loaded on the train, and, uh, uh, oh, well, it was another thing at the, at the mess hall one time. I got KP there. It happened to be the cooks slept in our barracks, you know, because it was right next to the mess hall. That was a good break. And I got KP in the morning. You had to hang a towel on the foot of your bed, and then they'd come along and wake you up in the morning. And so I go over there, and Rudy is a cook, some kind of foreigner. And he says, uh, now I want you to make mashed potatoes. Uh, okay. And he gives me a 10 gallon crock, you know. And uh, I said, he says, now put this much milk in it, and this much butter in it, and mix it up, you know, mash it. Okay, so I, Instead of adding a little bit at a time, I added the whole damn thing at one time. And it mashed it up. Then it got like soup. And he's going, oh, what am I going to do? I got to start serving the men and the potatoes is like soup. <laughs> you know? So I said, I'll fix it up. I go back to the pantry. I come out with a bag of flour and I thicken it with flour. <laughs> so he could serve it. He was worried. <laughs> Well, when we left there then, uh, everybody going to someplace else, you know. We went to Washington, we loaded on a train and he had a steamer. And these old oh, cars, you know, he hit the cushion like this and there was a black cloud come up, you know. And actually, I got the car right behind the engine. Oh, felt the uh, velour seats or velvet or whatever they were supposed to be. And then smoke, what they did is they waited on the siding and then they had it a regular passenger train or freight decent go first and then it's train followed that one just precaution over the bridges you know trusses and uh, and it always slowed over I don't know if they had guards and what on the trusses 
we got to Washington, I looked like I was a native from Africa. Black, I went to that washroom at the station and washed, oh, the water was running off like charcoal water. Cleaned up, and we got out of train, I went to Baltimore and Baltimore. Got on the Pennsylvania and came up to Buffalo. And we went back to Fort Orange, uh, Fort Orange, uh, yeah. No, it's Fort Shanks and Shanks at Orangeburg. Right. And there we got some uh, <coughs> uh, one, one or two. Oh. Yeah, we could get a couple of passes every now and then, you know, overnight. And uh, you get on a bus and geez, they had a big, great big bus and we went all the way down to Weehawken, New Jersey took a ferry across. Little did I know that one day I was going to be taking that same damn ferry. Then we went into New York and then we, we stayed here all and then figured the train or the bus and the train that you get back to camp at roll call. Mm -hmm. So we'd go to New York and went all the way around New York and I used to go and there was next to Jack Kempsey's and at the end of that block, there was a place, the revolving bar, they called it. Well, the bar didn't revolve, but up on top, that thing was going around with scenery all the time, you know. And next to it, they had a stand there, roast beef and ham sandwiches. Well, I don't know if that guy served them like that all the time, or if he just did it for the GIs, but boy, when you got a ham sandwich, and he sliced it that thick, well, we always made a point to stop there before we went for the, to get down the ferry and get a couple of sandwiches and take them back to camp, see, so when you fall out in the morning then you didn't have to go for breakfast, you had your sandwiches there. And that worked out pretty good that way. <coughs> so I learned how to get around the yard pretty good on the transit system there. And then, of course, one day we go down and go to Weehawken get off the train, this is going overseas then, uh, around Christmas time, right after Christmas as it was. And uh, you get out, you go in that thing and I, and I walk in this, uh, uh, what would you call it, where the docks are, you know, the dock is in the building. Port terminal. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's guys all along the roof of that thing next to each other, maybe that far apart, all with machine guns. I thought, what the hell is they going to make sure we get on that damn ferry? <laughs> well, I didn't know it, but what they were doing is emptying out a brig somewhere. They were going to make sure these guys all got on the boat because there's a lot of guys that went over the hill, see? Yeah. <clears throat> and we get on the ferry, which is the one we went to New York, you know. I thought we were going to go over to 42nd Street. We thought we get the ferry and then she drifts down the river. And he drifted down to a place called Bush Terminal. And then she goes in there and here these ships were lying high on the other side. Go into the warehouse. There's uh, Salvation Army, I remember them. You know, Red Cross, they charged you for things. The Salvation Army, they came here and they gave you donuts and coffee. Well, they gave you a donut and coffee as you're marching by, you know. And we loaded on this boat. And it was a C-2, a victory ship. It had been a freighter and they were converting it to a troop ship. And they were still working on it when we got on the ship. So naturally I got a detail of being a, a guard on the ship at night. So I had to go down, I was one of the first ones in there, and I went down, stood down below, and I took my bag and I threw it on a top bunk. They were four, four tiers high. And uh, some places they were about eight, no, six, eight high in the middle of the ship, you know? Them guys had to climb like a, one after the other, you know, and that would have been something. But anyway, <laughs> I threw my bag down and I had to get up on a boat. The men were working around there, welding rods were laying on the ground and everything else. And finally we had to leave. So I went downstairs and that 
It was cold as could be where my bunk was. I was right over an air vent. And I thought, I'll freeze here. Well, when it did, in a hurry, they hooked up that damn air conditioning and right away, there was <coughs> something cold air in from outside. And it blew right on that bunk. So I grabbed my bag and I found another place up front. No. <coughs> and I got against the and actually the others were in there and I had a bunk against the wall and the, the wall of the ship, whatever you want to call it. Well, that used to sweat. That got cold. So I saw, hung my shoulder hand on the side on a pipe, you know, so it would give you some protection from the cold. <clears throat> and then we jerked, we, I got up in the morning then and watched the Statue of Liberty go by, you know. We were in a long, line of ships going out to sea, all sizes, and we were on the tail end. Got out into the Atlantic, I don't know how far. I don't remember seeing the Statue of Liberty anymore, so it must have been out a while. And all of a sudden our ship turns, starts going down the Atlantic, and I thought something wrong with the boats, you know, because all the rest of them keep going, they're going to Europe. Well. And this, it's, uh, you know, a destroyer, and then there's a little, they made a little one, they call it destroyer escort, it's about half the size, you know. That comes along with us. And we start keep going down the Atlantic coast, and we kept on going and going. And then we went through, between Florida and Havana, I knew, <laughs> we were going, I thought, oh, maybe South America, or something like that, you know. Well, by the time we were going down, the ship wasn't put together right, you know. They didn't put baffles in somehow in the hole where the fuel was. So when the ship was going like this, as they used the oil, somehow they weren't taking it from the other side or couldn't switch it or whatever it was. It was going like this, you know. So it was, you figure you're going to come out with a long leg and a short leg. Well, <laughs> but you had to go below every night, you know. And this was. No lights, no nothing. No. But I belonged to every religion that there was, except the Jewish one. We didn't have that. You know, at night before you went in, they'd have the Catholic service. Then they'd have the Protestant service of the fantail. And that was singing hymns every night, Rock of Ages, boy. <laughs> but the ship, by the way, over, after, uh, by the time we got, we went to the Panama Canal, and by the time we got to the Panama Canal, they had to get all the troops on the other side of the ship, because it couldn't go into the canal, because it was lopsided. So, so we had to go through the canal. Everybody on one side. One side to keep it, well, when we go through the locks, not the regular, yeah. you know, canal locks. So every time we come to the locks, we had to get on one side until they got to Balboa. And then they uh, pulled it out and they were going to fix it. So they, uh, they gave us a, took us off and gave us a march around El Boy and brought us back. You know. <laughs> and they, they put in baffle plates or something. But I watched and we were tied up there, you know. And there's uh, we were just like on the wall, you know, like, I'd like I'd going on the bank of a creek. And we had a Navy tug behind us blackout every night and you know you had it and then, then they uh, they brought a barge along side and these Indians uh, whatever kind of Indians in Panama they climbed like monkeys all over the boat put the cables over the top they were demagnetizing it <coughs> and uh, one night one kid thought he was going to jump over you know uh, jump ship. He jumped. He <laughs> forgot that barge was there, I guess. He hit that. Well, the minute he jumped, though, the spotlight came around the tug. And they had him right away, you know, right on him right away. <coughs> so then we got that fixed out and we, <coughs> and we came and as we were going to leave, I watched the sub go out in the canal, you know. He went out in the ocean. Then we did. You remember the name of your 
troop ship? Do you remember the name of the troop ship? Uh, the troop ship that went down? The, the two that you went that, Yeah, that was the SS Warmick Dub. It belonged to more McCormick, McCormick Lines. That was the name of it, more mixed up. And we went there and we went to the Gallup, uh, Galapagos Islands. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, stood in the harbor. We didn't get off, you know. And I thought, gee, maybe we could, some of us could get stationed here, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. This is, you know, it was like a, a search point from there, you know. They sent out planes and mm -hmm. subs and stuff. To get. But I think it was mostly a Navy operation there. So then we went again and uh, went down the coast of South America to Chile and then cut across. <coughs> and we were in that Saragossa, not the Saragossa, <coughs> what the hell they call it? Anyhow, it's, it's a place where in the sailing days they used to get stranded, you know, and the wind would die. Mm -hmm. Went through that area. Now, while you were doing this, you were right, this was Company K, 129th Infantry at, at this point? No, this is a replacement. Okay, this is a replacement. Because, yeah, we're going to join the rockets. Oh, okay. And uh, one night, the alarm sounds off. Well, no, before that, they got out to sea, and they thought that they had one big gun mounted on the back, and they had one big gun mounted on the front. And the rest of them were these turrets, you know, where the uh, air, any aircraft and some machine guns. That's that's what they had on this thing. Mm -hmm. Well, the ship all left so soon. They didn't. They only had a few Navy men. So they took from the uh, troops. There was uh, anti-aircraft and so forth. They put them on the guns, you know, gave them tours on the guns with the Navy men. So they take this big gun, you know. And they're going to fire it and test it. And they put it straight out like this, and they fire it. And they do it all stand here really right off the deck. <laughs> Just a concussion, you know? <laughs> then one night, one day, they start to make out on the sea, you know, and this made me nervous too. You know, we stopped dead. And you know, I thought, well, what is it? Enemy submarine or something? And they're quiet. Well, there was a clacker going, make a noise, you know, an electrical clapper. Well, I know what happened. And so I, I didn't know what they were looking for, though. And uh, these guys are fooling around down there, and somebody threw water, must have got into that box, and shorted that clapper out. You know, it was going in and out, going in and out, making a good noise. <laughs> so the guy goes running by, I guess he must have been a merchant seaman or something. Maybe, maybe he had to. And I said, what are you looking for? He said, oh, we got some sound trouble here somewhere. I said, go down the first hole and look in there. Sure enough, that's what they're looking for. And then we got going again. And during the night, we got the, the alarm sounded. So I thought, boy, this is it. <clears throat> because that ship, all we had was one stairway up, you know, iron steps up. No bulkhead doors. And they left the walls in, they didn't put no doors in the bulk, between the bunks. <laughs> so if they blew their steps out, there was nothing, you know, no way. And we sweating it out. Everybody's just in their pants because it's hot down there. And uh, somehow or other, I don't know, between us and that Navy escort, and he wasn't too far away from us on the side, a destroyer pulled in between. And it was a Dutch destroyer. But he, evidently they made signals or something. So when we get, were up on deck, we looked, and there was that thing between our escort and him. They, they, you know, it would have been a big one, and they could have fired both of them right in the sea. So the rest of the trip was uneventful. And we got down to Numea. Did you have seasickness on the way over, or is that? Huh? Did you guys get seasick on the way over? I didn't. You know, that was a problem, see. Uh, they hung their berry spanks on the, in the iron bars, either cots. And, you know, they lay there and watched them things sway, and <laughs> they did seasick. We had one guy, he was seasick from the day he put his foot on that thing, and then he never ate, he never did nothing, he didn't look like a scout. And they made him, they made him come down and take him up and 
Call him up on deck, get fresh air. That guy died a million times on that ship. When I had going down, I had a district point. You only got fresh water once during the day. The rest was salt water to wash. So you got fresh water. You filled up your helmet so you could shave. And I came back and I hung my helmet up on the thing seat. And during the night, I'm sleeping and my leg hit the helmet and I tipped it. And it went down the next bunk and then the next one. <laughs> I quick jumped down there and got out of there. You know, they swore I peed on them at night. <laughs> But they didn't know for sure. <laughs> but I reached the mayor and loaded on trucks. He took us out of, to a camp. And uh, that's where we were assigned our divisions. And it was the same way here by alphabet, more or less. And we had one of our guys who kept making all the details. I went out one time, I was on a wood detail, you had to go, just down there they burned wood. And you had to go out in the woods, and uh, it was eucalyptus trees. And, you know, they it had to smell nice, I know. They had to, they had to uh, pay them governments for their trees after a while. Boy, they really sucked them all. Same way with the Guadalcanal, Canal, you know, when they, when they, government there charged the United States. For, you know, you know, here you save the country for them and they s send them a bill for the palm trees. <laughs> well, you see, when they send them a bill for a palm tree, they always figure one tree, two trees. There's always a male and a female, so one was gone, the other one was gone, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> double billing. And uh, so I took a bunch out and then they took us out in a truck and I don't know where they took us and uh, they had some roads through there. And they gave me two guys, two or three guys, and told us to cut a tree down and make sure it fell toward the road, and then they would come in with a thing and pull it to the road and then cut it up and take it back. So I was glad I had that detail because it was in the day, you know. But these eucalyptus trees, when I went, when we were going to camp, I was, you know, that bark comes off like transparent paper, and it's waving on the trucks, you know, like this. So I take these guys, and what have I got? A bunch from Brooklyn, you know? They don't know how to cut a tree. I don't know if they even see a tree. I had to start showing them how to chop, and then how to make it fall, you know? And then I, then I did it. And I, I let them drop the tree. So we dropped our big tree, and that was it. And uh, so we sat on the road and got picked up by a truck. And later on, then they come along with somebody else and they cut them up and brought them back. That was in the evening, see? So that, that was mosquito time. No good. <laughs> so then, then I got hooked up with this guy, Labby. He was in my tent. He came from Maine. And uh, he was a sign painter. So we had to fall out for details every morning, you know? So. He got wind of this detail of painting, sign painters. So he, he come on with me, you're a sign painter. You know, I didn't know nothing about painting signs. So he get detail me go down to the sign shop. Well this sergeant there, he's got a racket. He gets little coconuts from the natives about that big. And he paints senior like I did that one downstairs, you know. And then he takes them in town and sells them in souvenirs. <laughs> And some of the guys must have made a fortune in the army. And uh, <coughs> so we get signs. Well, they had a bunch of guys there. They put them in a tent. And they, some of them cut boards with an arrow, you know, like this is the point. And then they, they paint them yellow. So this, uh, this uh, who, can, who can do lettering? Lad, he steps up and he shoves me with him, you know. And I know I can't letter. <laughs> Okay, he gives us a list. Lieutenant so and so, Captain so and so, make these signs. You can take them back to the tent. So we take them back to our tent. So we get back there, Larry shows me how to make the letters, you know, and you put this little end on the thing, 
you know, just that odd that rough brush stroke, that brush stroke, see? So we're sitting there making signs. Good. And uh, then we got done with that. We fell out, and then we had a detail, and one of the lieutenants came over and he says, Hey, could you guys make me a chest of drawers? And I said, We ain't got nothing to make a chest of drawers, you know? And I remember walking around, marching around the camp, there was one place where there was a bunch of boards, redwood boards, like that. <clears throat> and he says, well, try anyhow, will you? Make me a cabinet so I can put my clothes in. I often wonder what happened to his clothes. <laughs> we had a nail, I mean, a, a hammer, a saw, and a pocket knife. <laughs> <laughs> So what we did is go down to the PX in the morning and we get the empty cases and knock the nails out. That was another good break. We get to the PX and they would open up, see this, the regular camp guys, is, uh, they would go down to the PX, well with the others, you'd have to do details in the morning, they, didn't, they, they were just crowded. So you could go down there in the morning when it opened up and you stand in line for ice cream. Well, you get in line. And you get your ice cream, the cups, you know, they, they made it like, like this frozen stuff, you know, but it wasn't real hard, but it was like ice cream. And you put right on the end of the line, get in line, and eat your ice cream on the way up, so you did it <laughs> <laughs> Well, we finally got enough nails, we took a tent, it was half full of jackets, you know. So I had one of those pit and dirty, so I looked through the pile, they take these away from you because you come from the north. You, Field jackets, I mean. And uh, I see a new one there, so I threw mine in and took the new one. <laughs> I kept them with me. I never turned mine in. And uh, we started sawing and hammering and sawing and hammering. We finally made it, you know, and we made the door pulls, just strips like that, and then shaped them with the knife. And oh, we fix it up real good. Make it look nice and wrecked, you know. And then we went. <coughs> And we got diesel oil rubbed all the way with diesel oil. <laughs> that must have been good for his clothes, right? <laughs> and but we took it over to his tent. But we kept, I don't know, I think he must have been stationary all the time. And all he had was a cock in there, you know. And uh, the whole tent was over there, right to the top. I don't know if it was for the offices or maybe it was liquor too. All cases, you know, you had to walk around the edge on the outside. See, the whole center was piled up with this stuff. You know, he caught on the end there. So he moved the finger, you know. Oh, he thanked us. I thought, I wonder if they'd have all so cute. <laughs> 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 well, then we got shipped out again. And we went to the part of embarkation, but it was the same thing. Well, this is the only spruce all the ones. See, there she is. These are the ones that came out. You didn't hang on around long enough to get into the pictures, though. Huh? You didn't hang around long this enough to get into the pictures. This is when we sent them back. See yeah. their cobbles for me? Yeah. See when they loaded on this thing? We took them across the river? Yeah. Right there. I remember that. See, I had this picture so long ago. You know. <coughs> Okay. Yeah. From Nemea, he went where? Was that? Nemea? Uh, well, there we went. We had to go to the embarkation point in a port. In the like plaster, the dirt. And this is, they would bulldoze the line like this is the tents, and then goes up, bulldoze the line, just like roads, you know, for the road tent. And that was. Them cooks they had there and stuff. They all they could make was spam. <laughs> they probably figured here today and gone them out. They didn't care at all. <laughs> and uh, same thing. Marches around for busy. And then they take us out and they get the line and we would keep going down Lady and I and another guy, Shelley, come from Florida. Keep moving to the rear, you know, let the other guys walk faster. Get to the end, and they're taking, taking a few pills. This one goes there, there's somebody there, there's somebody there, and they got to the end. 
and there was military police. <laughs> I think they took about six guys out of the brig, and they had to go and fix the sidewalks around the offices area, you know, and cut the grass and stuff like that. So I sit there with my gun, because, you know, if one of them guys go, they're in trouble. You gotta serve their time if they don't get them. And uh, I would sit there, you know, and then they, they had no cigarettes or nothing, and I would toss them a cigarette like this, you know. <laughs> they, they stayed right there. I didn't bother them to work or anything like that. They just kept doing it pretty good. Took them back in, and that was it. The point there was a good deal. You worked eight hours, and then you were off for two days. And then you went back on again. Well, I never went back on because we had to ship out. But after we get through with our eight hours, we got to pass to Numea, you know, the town. So we went into the town, and uh, <clears throat> this is French. Twelve o'clock, they close all the stores and everything, and they all go home. And they all shutters closed, and they all take siestas. <laughs> Three o'clock, they open up again. <laughs> A lot of the stars only had bars for windows. They don't even have windows, you know. And uh, so we go to the Red Cross. You can buy donuts and coffee and fruit juices, you know. Then we walked around the town and then uh, went in this place called Liberty Cafe. And I never, you know, I love coffee. But I didn't think I was going to have French coffee, you know, that thick, syrupy stuff in a little cup. You know. Holy man, I couldn't stand that. So the next time we were drinking, I drank tea. I couldn't go to that stuff. Then we went back to camp. And right away we got to pack up and ship out. And we went up the line. I remember. Same uh, ship or a different one? Huh? Same ship or a different one? No, oh, we could get different ships. This time we were on a, a Navy transport. And that was good. We get, you know, good food, clean ships. Oh, yeah, I'm telling you something. I couldn't believe it. You got on this ship and uh, go through the mess with your tray and back, plop, 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 all the stuff on these guys are loading you, you know. Get on the end, you get a piece of pie. I hadn't seen pie on the wind. That was good. And then that guy slaps a big scoop of ice cream on top of it. <laughs> we took that up to, to uh, uh, the Spirit of Santos, and from there we went to Guadalcanal. From there we got off. And uh, we went to uh, Laguna Beach, which is next to Henderson Airfield at that time. What, when would this have been? This have been early 1943? Yeah. Uh, just before, you're on Easter time. And uh, then we got on a little schooner. Uh, you know, a little, uh, what was it, an island vessel. It was like the old, it was even smaller than the Erie Beach Boat, the old Erie Beach Boat. All it was was like a, like an oversized tug, one cabin, and they must have been taken to take, see, because it, it, it kind of the subs there, and that's the slot they call it, it was 25,000 feet deep on there. They were using shallow boats, not the big, transport you see to go up to Bowdenville. And uh, the crew, they had a great big heavy chain and a great big padlock around the refrigerator. That's the only thing that was in the room, you know. <laughs> These GIs, they'll take everything. And I, uh, a top, I, then it had a, a roof on it, you know. It was open, just holes, and then the roof. And I was sitting up on the roof by the stack. You know, they were all over the thing to get out of that little boat. And they took us up to Empress Augusta Bay. And uh, that's where they went in, you know, because that, the Japs didn't expect them to go into that place because it was all swampland. It would be one of the least places they were going to go into. That's where they got on that side of the island when the Japs were on the other side of the island. And then I fell in there. That's where I got that damn malaria, right off the bat. Hmm. The first night I went into the foxhole, you know, they assigned us to our squads. And 
the guy says, do you want to sleep on the bottom or do you want to sleep on the top? And, uh, you know, the regular guys were taking the watch. And he says, well, we'll take the regular watch during the night, you know. And uh, Bill Box, you know, was down in the ground, damp, and then you got an opening about that big between the logs. That's where you fire. So I took the top one because it had a mosquito net on it. But I never knew somebody kicked the whole back end out of it. So I was loaded with mosquitoes because that's where they are, where that opening was, you know, on the, on the dugout, on the pillbox. Well, shortly after that, the, and it was on a ridge, and the pillbox was on this side. And on the other side, it sloped down a little bit, and they let us put tents up there. And then you'd go out there and watch, you know, but stay out of the bunk, out of the pillbox. That was a, quite a time there. Did you come down with the malaria <coughs> right away? No. No, but I know that's where I got it, you know. <coughs> First night there, and I didn't know what it was all about. And uh, there were so many mosquitoes, and I got bit. And I didn't know, you know, that I, down in the New Maine, you got bit by mosquitoes, you got this algae uh, uh, fever which made you wish you want to die because every bone and everything but ache, but it was very seldom fatal. But this other one, it depends how you got it, you know, in your body or in your head. In your head, you went delirious. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it was my body, I guess. <coughs> and uh, one night I was sitting on the bunk, you know, we had our base, and uh, I was sitting on the bunk, you know, and I started shaking, and I was getting cold. And I thought, Jesus, what am I, nerves are going to hell or what, you know? Because we'd been out on patrols. And uh, I, then I asked this Mike, he was a Mexican kid. We had five bunks in, in five cots we made, bunks we made, cut palm trees and strung telephone wires back and forth for a spring, and then put your gulp in your jungle hammock on it, and that's what you slept on instead of sleeping on the ground. And I asked him if he was cold. He said, no. And I put on a jacket, and I had that field jacket. I still had it. And I put that on, and then I laid on the thing and put the blanket on top of me. And I was still cold. And I couldn't, this is at night, and I couldn't go up to the medics, because nobody walked around when it got dark. You could get shot. And the next morning would be gone. You know, I would come up to a real good sweat, be ringing wet. And then I would be, my teeth were chattering like castanets. I couldn't stop them. And then I uh, would just change. It'd get real hot. And I'd start peeling stuff off. And I'd be ringing wet when I got done. But in the morning, well, I had all the aches and pains. But I didn't have the fever anymore, so I couldn't go to the medics. <laughs> and uh, that's when I knew I got it. That was on Bougainville, or was that later on? That was on Bougainville. And then uh, after, well, we'd go out on patrols and things. You went out, like, listening posts and things like that, you know. You'd send out a platoon uh, for a listening post, or some places you had only three men, which in fact, this is on front of the lines. <coughs> and, uh, then sometimes you take the whole that uh, platoon and you go up for nine days, way up the river, and go out on patrols. And you can you imagine you have to take your own supplies along, food. So they give you K rations and C rations. Well, you know every C ration is two. So you go back to camp and separate them. You know you only had the choice of beef stew, beef hash, and meat and beans ground meat with beans, you know. And a lot of guys didn't like the stew. And they would take the hash. Well, I swapped the hash for the stew because the hash was made in Australia and all it was was cubed potatoes with some onion. with nothing else in there. Hmm. So you'd figure, well, I could do without this, do without that, but you always took the dry because you had three cigarettes in there. And you had toilet paper, hard candy, biscuits, you know, which was compressed uh, sawdust. 
<laughs> well, you can remember eat, those. <laughs> eat it dry or you know. And uh, the K rations, well, you got a square pack about an inch. And there was nine cigarettes in there, and hard candy and things like that. And so you take so many of the K rations and so many, and you figure yourself, I could skip this meal, skip that meal. Some days, you know, when there was action like that, you never even ate, never even was hungry. But, uh, you know, until later on, you sat down and you thought about, gee, I didn't eat. And so we go out and then the, this place we came to where the Japs had been bivouacking, see? So they set up, set up on the bottom flatland there with machine guns to cover the river. And then they're going to send patrols up and over. Well, on this side, there was a wall sheer up. In my right mind, I would never do anything about it but just look at it. I had to climb up that wall, me and two other guys, to make an outpost up there. And if the enemy ever came down there, there was no way out of there. Mm -hmm. Because you can't get down that, scale that wall. And I don't know how, how high it was, this high. Going by rock and rock and you get your pack on your back, you know? And thank God for the vines, they were like, Manila rope. You could hang on them and they would hold, you know? And that's the way you went up there. You got crawl over the top and then there was a pathway. It's just a pathway. Went right up straight. You could, Ten feet and you couldn't see the guy's feet ahead of you. That's how steep it was. Because we knew on the other side, you could hear the Japs over there. You know, they were down there playing ball and hollering and all that. And right near was the volcano. So I'm off the side of the trail, there was a, a ledge, and that's where the three of us sat. And I dropped a pebble down there and I listened. It took a long time before I could hear it hit the bottom. I knew. Boy, if they get us here, we ain't got nowhere to go. And uh, we, two would sleep and one would watch. It was just that dark, we could go up and string a wire, tri trip wire across that trail. We could two empty sea ration cans on with empty shells in it. So they broke the wire with rattle. And we could hear it up. After that, then we put another trip wire and tied to the trees. We had two grenades, you know, with the wire tied to the pins. And the pins squeezed so they'd come out easy. That's the way we slept that night. <laughs> and then a couple nights of that, and then we came down again. We had to go down and off that thing again. I don't know how we ever climbed it down. So then they took us the next day up the other side. And the report was that up on the plateau up there, there was a Japanese hospital. So they were supposed to go up and investigate it. A lot of these things I didn't think of at the time, but some of them came back to me. I had to leave that thing out again. And uh, going up there, we come to a spot see a, a little footpath down to the river, a creek the river was there, because the river was on that side. You could see these uh, boot marks, they were Japanese boot marks. You know, they had the pegs on them, like. <clears throat> and there was a little hut there, or just a lean-to made out of bamboo. It looked like native, though. But there was a trail went this way, and there was one went up the hill this way. So the captain was deciding which way to go. And we said, he said, we go up, we'll go up. I heard a bird whistle in a tree. I thought it was a bird, but you know, there could be, there's a lot of animals over there, all kinds, you know, uh, parrots and everything else. But that whistle I never heard before. It was strange, and I, I'll swear to this day it was a jab. He was whistling which path we were taking, signaling them. So we go up that thing, and there's a great big tree, about that big, right across the trail. Well, there's about that much room underneath to crawl under it, or you got to go over the top. Well, you know damn well going over the top is going to be pretty risky, because you're on top, with your rifle in that, you could be picked off just like a clay pigeon. But we decided to go over the top. We did. We got up a little bit, fire started. When I hit the tree next to this mic, and he got splinters in his eye. So the captain thought, 
we better, you know, go back. So he called for retreat, but I, you should see that big tree. I went under it, and I don't know how I ever cleared it, and everybody else did too. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we went down the path, and just beyond that tree, and set up an ambush, you know, alongside the trail. Figured they'd come after us. But they didn't, and then you sent Mike down to get medical treatment. And the next day, we had to go back up again. And they, and they, they pulled out of that hospital. There was nobody there. Hmm. And I'm never, never too sure, but I, that whistle always bothered me. And I think that's what it was, oh, because I know it happened later on. But you know, you think you're, you're a strange land, maybe it's just a bird you didn't hear. Hmm. And then we came back out of there, and that was another one where the vines were. These two rivers come together. And in there, and the other one was you know, and they were pretty much of a torrent because the mountains, you know, it seemed like the clouds scraped them every day and they ripped them open, and there was always rain, and every day is rain. And that swirl there, like a real big world jeep. So we couldn't, the jungle was too thick to go on top, so you had to go along the wall, stepping on these vines hoping and hanging on the other bite on top, hoping that the hands would you drop in there and forget it. And that's the way we went up there. And then we got back to camp and things like that, you know, and then uh, <coughs> we had some times down there. <laughs> yeah. But when I was that heavy combat or was that just light or trolls? Trolling action? Because they beat them back mm -hmm. earlier, see. And, but they were sending out patrols too. And you know, they figured they were going to make another attack, see. But uh, they were hitting them with airplanes over on the other side because they watched when a ship would come in with supplies, they'd go and hit them. And then they started raising victory gardens for food because they were getting cut off for their supplies. And then they had a plane equipped with like a big exhaust pipe. And he had oil in there. And he would fly over and boil the whole vegetable and kill them. Hmm. Every now and then and they did that. But we had some some experiences there. Yeah, you know, you could, that jungle was so thick. You could sit right next to the path, maybe a foot back, and they could walk by and never see you. We used to do that once in a while on the guy. The same way you go out and patrols, you know, sometimes you go out far. <clears throat> it was a security, you know. And the one place you had to go across a creek, and it was quicksand. So they dropped a palm tree from one side and they dropped a palm tree from another side. So the palm tree was about that big, and then, you know, it got down to narrow, and it met about the middle of the creek. And then the other one was there, and you had to you know, on that one, they go, they had long, they had reeds there, and we'd cut two reeds, like ski poles, and use them and go real fast over that thing, because the father you went out, the more it sank into the water. Mm -hmm. And then get on to the other one and quick get on the other shore. Every time you could hear a splash, I could tell it was this Mike, the Mexican <laughs> kid, he'd fall in. He'd, when it come to make it from one to the other, he missed the thing because it was under water. <laughs> he'd miss it. We fall in, scramble out quick, you know. And you know that, like you go up, up. The one patrol took us to meet another outpost. You had to contact them, and we'd walk along the end. It was like walking on rubber. You'd keep walking quick, you know, because you would start the crust on it like a rubber top. Mm -hmm. and your foot would sink in, and then you'd see dead Japs laying out in the middle of the hell with them, you know, they're going to sink anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was something. But that might keep falling every time, so help me. He must have hated those patrols. Yeah. And knowing every time he's going to go in. And then at one night there, we had to go out to another, uh, we relieved another outfit, you know, just a squad. That, I got the picture on the wall. That was a mixed up squad. You know, it took two guys from this squad, two guys from that squad, and two guys from that squad, not the whole squad. And we had to go out there and man this here outpost. This was toward the end. 
So you, what you do is they had dragged combat phone wire rods, you know, on a reel, and then they cut poles and chopped a banana tree in half and then slid it, which is like corrugated inside a banana tree. And then you put them on the roof like this and then put the other ones this way so the rain would just run off. But they had that, in the middle they had that big iron reel that they rolled out to get the pounds. It was a sound foam, you know? So we were taking turns on that thing. And uh, I get my watch, and I ain't feeling too good. And uh, I'm sitting on that thing and holding the phone to my ear, see, because it's connected with headquarters back there, and we're supposed to keep in contact with them. Lightning strikes that line somewhere. I had that metal phone in my ear, boy, and I was sitting on that metal thing, and I flew off that thing and I was high in the air. I was afraid to sit down with anymore. <laughs> then I had to go and wake up the next guy. And I, we came in, you know, and it was just before dark. And, you know, the guys had to get back, get through the minefields before it got black, dark, you know. And uh, I couldn't find him. <laughs> you know, because all we did was just come in so late, we just gave him our, uh, our, uh, uh, you know, sleeping hammocks, jungle hammocks, which had netting around. And we swapped them. Well, the one I got was an old one and had holes in it again. And I had a brand new one. And I had turned mine in and got a new one. So some guy got a good one and I got a raw deal. Well, I had three of them strung to one little tree like this. And during the night, that thing cracked. You know, the termites were just about but the three hung out like that. It never, they never went to the ground. It's just each one held it up. And they slept anyhow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, I think, the last patrol out, and then we got ready to go to re outfit and that to go to uh, Luzon, Manila. And then we went from there, went back and trained a while, you know, loading artillery on vessels and then unload them and load them. You get three shells, three big shells in the box. But you just tongue them like this instead of carry them. You get them right up there. Mm -hmm. We practiced that way and then we finally loaded on a boat and away we went. We went to Leahy. And by that time, I had been to school in, in the afternoons, you know. In the mornings we had, in the afternoons you were free when we were back in the basement. And I would, they had, signal car, radio men, something else. But I went to one and I was being a linesman, how to string wires. You know, put them things on the climb the poles, well you climb trees. And you had a rope around here. But well, you start out with a big tree and then it keeps getting narrower and you gotta keep taking the slack in. Make sure them things dig in and gently uh, mahogany or ironwood trees yeah. And they had a thick bark, and when you pierced them, white milk ran out. And they always had vines growing up there, that stuff, you know, and there was dirt and stuff, and the bulbs would grow and loaded with ants. So when you got up there, you only had these great big ants, too. A lot of guys would start with the dumb ants and forget, you know, and, and that's, you had to keep the legs pitched like this. And they would straighten out and the hooks would come out and they'd come right down and they'd burn her face, you know, because it finally went down to close to the right. Rope was pulling to the tree. And uh, I learned how to do that. They called it the Bogan, the Bogan wheel weave. You had to put the thing on, you took three or four strands of wire, put it around one way, and then you put your line up there and then you wove this on it. The point was, because there'd been so many lines broke, when the trees fall, so you know, good, they get wet, heavy, with a good rain, and the termites got it to that point, and they would fall and tear the lines down. Well, this way, the, the line wouldn't break, it would break loose from the holding, see, that, that we, we gave it, and so the line would lay on the ground and wouldn't break. Mm -hmm. And then I also went there and I learned how to, well, you went through a lot of weapons, you know, and then they made me a bazooka man. I had to learn how to fire a bazooka. Oh, right. 
And that's what I had to go with. That's what I was what I wanted to lose on. From then on, I was a rifleman, then I went to the bazooka. Oh, and I also was the pioneer squad. I had to learn how to dynamite buildings and bridges and trees. I could take a fix these quarter pound dynamite, you know, for a 12 inch tree, use four of them, tape them together, wrap it on a tree, set the fuse, whatever like you want so you can get out of here quick, and bite the thing and put it down there and beat it. And I can blow a 12 inch tree clean right off the thing. Because <laughs> you concentrate your fire. Well, after that, that was what that was at. See, you know, I was supposed to use a Bangalore batita, torpedo, torpedoes and all that stuff. I don't know, I was everything in that thing. And uh, then I was a bazooka man going up there. So when we went up there, they went to Leyte. Uh, uh, not Leyte, uh, Ley, a new Guinea. But we didn't get off the boat. But it was the train to go over the side of the boat, get in the landing ships, go in and come back, and then go up there. Things. Well, the first time, you loaded all your equipment on. I had my pack, and on top of the pack, I had a backboard. I had a backboard first, and on there I had six rocket shells strapped. And I had my pack on top of that, with my shelter hat and all rolled up, and the blanket. And uh, at, uh, then I had to carry the bazooka, plus my rifle. I had grenades strapped on my legs. I had a bag, it was about 18 inches tall, about that wide, and about that wide, full of extra rounds of ammunition on my shoulder, hanging on the side. Two bandoliers across the top. Well, I got up there and you'd line up against the wall and the ship get on and the officers would call somebody to go over to the thing in the boat. And I, re I couldn't go like this, I'd fall over, see? So I had to stay like this all the time. Well, the first time I went over, I had a heck of a time keeping my balance, crawling down the landing nets, you know, mm -hmm. and then you had to wait for the wood to come up with the wave and get it before it went down. In other words, you get your foot between in the hole and you get a pounding. So I told the lieutenant about it. So the next time he says, all right, you don't go over the next side. So three other times I missed it, you know. The other guys all went over the deck. Yeah. And I just stood against the wall. Well, I can imagine, you must have some weight on you there, because I, I, I got out of a helicopter I once with two bandoliers only, and it was like hitting the ground with rubber lighting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, but that they must have weighed 50, tank. 60 pounds. So, we went into, uh, and then from there we went into Manus Island. Christmas was at Manus Island. I remember that. And the here's the ships are laying all around, but just before we got there, one of the ships near where we were anchored, it was an ammunition ship and he got a hit and blew the whole thing to hell. Oh, the Jap come along and he skimmed over and he got under the radar. And where did he come from? One. He hit that ammunition, you know, all the rest when he could hit a troop ship. Because they were forming. So it came to the day he went to Christmas. We were supposed to have uh, turkey, you know. So you got a ticket to go through in the line. Now look, we're on a west, we're on an Australian ship. This is after the Navy one. And they make a sauce to put on everything. It's like flour and water, you know? There's no taste to it. And they put it on everything. Yuck! So they start complaining about uh, the, the food. So they, they argued it out, and, you know, and, the cook in the galley, he's the captain of the galley, there's nobody going to tell you what to do. But they finally got it where they would allow American personnel to make coffee. Because the coffee they made was <laughs> out of this world. So we at least got good coffee. And uh, came time for that dairy, you know, and they run out of turkey. The guys on the end got canned spam. Oh, what a hoot and a holler there was. And they would boil eggs, and the damn eggs were black, rotten. So I used to take bread. So and then you know when the ship was rocking, I would eat that bread to keep my stomach working. So one time I remember down in the mess hall, this guy is taking each piece of bread and he's holding it up to light. He's going like this. So I hold it up to light. I see all these black spots. 
I could eat these meagles all the while. <laughs> He's a friend. Well, the man know that they shipped and left the company there, the uh, detachment to clean it up, you know, and they found these turkeys in the freezers. They were going to have it on the way back by street and sailors. Hmm. And the stupid thing about that is, too, they were like the British. It got uh, in the middle of the morning, in the middle of the afternoon, no matter what the hell they were doing, they stopped and had tea. So why did they didn't stop the boats? Well, they couldn't. They were an American convoy, I suppose. So he went up that way. I see that Princeton get hit, that air carrier. Boy, he got the kamikaze, he got that. I thought it would sink, but... This is where in the Straits? Or in the, yeah. in the islands, in the Straits, but the Gulf? In the, I guess it was the China Sea. Hmm. Yeah. He was off of one of the islands there, I think, uh, Leyte or Hanoi. And uh, just the one night, the one, uh, one but it's just evening, and the, the, the chaplain on the boat was going to have services. Well, he didn't have too much room, and he took on the fantail of this your Australian ship, and he started mass, see? And uh, these kamikazes come in, and they come right down the line, and he was firing. Well, I, I didn't know it. I thought the captain, you know, when they go when they're in the convoy, like they go so long this way, and then they go this way, and they zigzag. And just as that guy, he'd come along these planes, and he'd go and he was going to pick our vessel. And just as he got there, because I was on the fan tail to see him coming. But the, the lead was sliding, we were all trying to get inside this uh, cabin, you know. The priest turned around and told us to go inside, but he kept on saying mass. And I was right inside the door so I could see that plane coming. Just as he was going to plow into the back of us, which had been curtains for us, the thing went this way, and he went right alongside of it. According to that story I read there, uh, their gunners hit him. And then I ran over the rail and watched Jack look at us like this. Down he went. <laughs> so then we got to going up the islands. You get the raids every now and then. And uh, we got off of Manila at night, off of Corregidor in Manila, you know. Tokyo Rose was on. But we didn't go that way. We didn't keep going up north. We went out on the China Sea. So she comes on with the radio. We had her on all the time. Saying it looks like they're going uh, to they go up to Formosa. See? When the during the night, we turn around and come back and <laughs> went in Lingan Gulf. Made the beachhead there. And they probably thought that big armada went, see. Boy, I'm telling you, that there, that was the time I walked the steam right off my feet when we made that invasion. Well, there, I had that bazooka and uh, on this Australian ship, they had a, a life preserver they called Mae West. Did you ever see them? Yeah. They're rubber with a, you just use them on the front, you blow them up. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we had to put on, see, to get in the landing barge. And then when we get that, on the beach, you're supposed to pull the strap and let them drop on the beach, and then you pick them up later. Well, I had them, and I'm glad I didn't drop mine. The guy, that Aussie boats, they wouldn't go too close to shore. So we jumped in the water right up to our necks. Now you load it down, the bandoliers and all that stuff I told you. Try moving fast in water that deep. Did you have a calm night for it at least? Huh? Was it a calm night at least? Early in the morning this is. Oh, okay. Right at daybreak. Because you all, you know, early in the morning you were out there circling in these boats all getting in line until the signal would come and they all went in. Mm -hmm. I hit that beach, and I scrambled up that beach, peeing in my pants all the way. <laughs> I had a cold, but it didn't make any difference. It was wet anyhow, right up to my neck. And to get into the edge of the beach, you know, and get under the trees, palm trees, you didn't know what to expect. And uh, then I, uh, I took that thing, and by that time, being wet and all, I was rubbing the skin off my shoulders from this packboard, mm -hmm. and then my fanny. 
So I, I put that thing and I glued it up so it was about an inch thick. I put that under my shoulder seat, kept my backboard on it, made it easier on my shoulders. They never did get it back. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> it was a, a place called Tegupen. It's a funny name, isn't it? Sounds Dutch. You get that, you know. And I had, ar I had armor piercing shells in my rifle. And there was a pipe sticking up on the back of this building, you know, and I wanted to see if my rifle worked. So I took aim at that pipe and I hit it. And the water squirted out. Well, I, I didn't know they had artichokes in the You kept squirting out. I hit the pipe and put a hole in it, actually, with an <laughs> armor piece of shell. Well, behind that house, then we run up, and there was a dugout down there. And there was a woman laying on a door, a flat board or something. And she was staring up. And I hollered down, it's all right, you can come out now. She never moved. And I realized she was dead. She probably died in Nashville or something. I don't know. But I didn't realize at the time that she was dead. And then we went from one place to another. You know, it was, you got them on the move and we, you didn't want to give them a chance to set up. So she tried to get the in the slit trench and before you get it finished, you had to move some other place. You go from one town to another, chase them, you know. And it was all day that after the beach, walk, 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 and had to go through a river. The bridge was out, so it was, luckily it wasn't real deep. You had to wait across that. And then we laid alongside the road because they had a t we had a tank for the night. And uh, then we started walking again. Well, I wore, you know, I had double sewn socks on, and I walked the skin off of my foot, right from behind the toes, the sole of the foot, to the instep. It was just a flap of skin on that thing. I didn't know it, but I was walking and walking and walking. And finally, I had to drop out. I had all this equipment, and I couldn't, I just dropped on the side of the road. I thought, the hell with the war. <laughs> and uh, they kept going. So after I rested, there was a few others. Start going down the road again. Didn't know where my outfit was, but I knew they had to be down the road somewhere. And finally, I caught up to them. And then I took my shoes off. My socks were bloody. I went to the medics, and he put iodine on them. Yeah. Oh, that was <laughs> so not What else are you going to do? Uh, and uh, wrapped it up in a bandage. And you know, that skin grew back on. Hmm. That's amazing. Well, I, I couldn't believe it. Boy, I was walking on raw flesh. That was burning. No wonder I got numb after a while and I didn't feel nothing, see? That's why I never realized it. I couldn't believe it ever happened like that. Just peeled it right back, huh? I, I, I can't understand how it did it. Tore it loose. Maybe wet shoes and wet sock all the time? Yeah. Well, a lot of others too. Salt though. water and everything else too. Hmm. Well, he we caught up there, and there, there was one of the days too. And the next day, it dig a slit trench, bingo, move. Dig a slit trench, bingo, move. You know, always they get reports of chaps going this way or going that way. You cut them off or try to hit them off. And after a while, I was just keeping. I made a couple of cigarettes to dig a slit trench for me because I figured it was a waste of time. I couldn't do it anymore. And at one place I had the vote, I thought we were going to stay. And I had a woman, I bought a chicken from her. And she was going to roast it. You know, and they build a fire and they roast it in a palm leaf. Wrap it up in a palm leaf and cook it. Well, it wasn't quite done yet and we had to move it again. Mm. So I took the chicken to where it was and ate it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, that was something. Boy, that Manila, no, that was something. The landing was... All city. Yeah. You guys were first in then, right? 37th, huh? 37th was first in? Yeah, and they made us come back out. But, but the thing was, what they made us come back out was, there was a brewery there. And when the GIs discovered the brewery, anybody could get a five-gallon can filled it up with beer. <laughs> beer all over the place until it was running the beer was even running green after a while it was, wasn't even aged hmm. 
the neighbor sucked me out of weeds until the others got in there. And then we went back in again. Doesn't sound like you had that bad a time, right? Oh, kind of. <laughs> oh, you had a lot of, of beauty, so. Gee, I, I slept on the back of a truck coming out of after a campaign. My helmet on and then hot holded road and then my helmet would bounce like this on my head and I slept anyhow sitting right up. <laughs> so tell me about the Battle of Manila. That was, you guys went in eventually, I mean after, after MacArthur. Oh yeah, the then we were going in. We had the one section of the city to take and we got into there and then we had to go to Kizan City they called it and uh, put a roadblock up in there. And that was another one. We had a bridge there, Bailey Bridge built over at sea, so we they took half a dozen of us and made it over the river. And there was what we must have been a like a gas station or something, just a little building, you know. So that's where we made our place. And we had to search the people going back and forth for guns, you know, make them open up their baskets and stuff. We tried to keep it at a minimum and then patrol it at night. So one night I'm walking up and down the bridge, looking at the river, you know, and my gun trigger housing got caught on my belt, pulled out of my rifle, and I grabbed the top and the bottom, the stock, you know, and my river, my thing went into the river, my trigger housing, <laughs> out there with no gun, <laughs> two pieces of no, no functioning. So I went back to the other thing and got somebody else to take the thing and then I, when the chief came around with hot coffee the next morning, I had him tell the gunsmith that I needed a new trigger housing, you know, and they sent one up. <laughs> Gee, was that, ain't that nice out there with no gun? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, after <laughs> here, we came back out again. This is where, this is where the, the artillery was still pounding the city or is this, this was? Yeah, parts of it, different parts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you're, you're, st you're out, uh, you get your, you go in and you relieve somebody, you go into the battle, and then you come out and you go out, you don't just sit there or anything, you go out and you put out uh, uh, reconnaissance or uh, roadblocks, anything to stop them from getting reinforcements, you know. <coughs> so that's the way you work that. There was house so to house. So then we went back in. Huh? House to house combat then? Uh, it was in most of the business di district, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we got into there, and you know, I, I never could see it. There was a, I don't know how many, I, I think I got, might be a picture of one of these places. It's too long? I'm starting to smell it, so. It oh, no, no, it's no, a alarm didn't go. Oh, okay. And uh, <clears throat> there's a church there, made out of, completely made out of cast iron. It was made in Belgium and moved there. Hmm. Can you imagine a whole church out of cast iron? I was surprised when I bought yeah, it. And uh, then we came back, we had to go back in, and uh, this one company and another regiment, and some guys they had trained with were in there. They were having problems. They had to get across this river, and there was a little island out there, and it was piled with coal. They had big build, a couple of big buildings on it, but just the piers and the floors, no windows, no walls, because it was machinery, it was a generating plant. <laughs> and uh, they were having a heck of a time getting the hell knocked out of them. So they sent us up there to give them relief. So we had to get over that island, and then we hit that building, and uh, between that building, the island, and the next part, there was a bridge. So you all would, that bridge was, you know, the river was there. And there's some all along them different old buildings down there, factories and stuff. There were snipers, machine guns. So you had to run across that bridge with time. And uh, take your chances. <laughs> This course, so he was ahead of me, good thing. He run, when he got on the other side, they got his mess gear on his backpack. He got shot through there, it was a pretty close call. And then I run, nothing happened. <laughs> 
doctors, you know, you figure that I think either you gotta get their sights again or something. And uh, we got in there and we went into the thing and we couldn't, there was a bus barn there and we went in down the road and I was surprised when I came back down that road to see all the mines they took out of there. They had used all those big artillery shells and buried them in the road. Luckily, we were walking the sidewalk. They had the street, you know, mostly for tanks, I suppose. But there was such narrow streets, you couldn't use tanks in a lot of places. And uh, <coughs> we went down, we got on the wall, we sat on the wall in Manila. Well, these sisters there, I, I meant to tell you, after I got them out of there, then Kelly and I went forward, went into tell the... Me, tell me about that again, while, while the tape's running. This is, this is where? This is in the city itself? This before is in the Nero, Wall City of Manila. Mm -hmm. and, is that, and then they, she came running out to me, and, you know, jabbering, and then yeah, you the were, other... You were a point man going around the corner? And well, no, then I didn't know what the hell to do with her, you know? Yeah. And then the other four came. Then I was afraid because I thought maybe the Japs were sending them out and going to come right out behind them and make a charge. And then I told them to go that way, you know, follow them. And then they finally understood me and they walked out. And then we went inside, and as we went inside, it must have been like a, sand, uh, a chapel side, you know, which is a big pillar there. And then they had a stone wall about that high, and there was a woman sitting there. And she had no, her leg was shot off. He held up his hands. And all his fingers were blown off right at the knuckles. Clean. Not even bleeding. You know, in the same way, it looked like it put cellophane on him, just a shiny stub, you know, the heads. Mm. And uh, so then we don't bother. We keep on going. And somebody's going to come behind us and take care of the cleanup and stuff. So Kelly and I go around into the church and go in, and we're going to go out the side door to go into the street. And they come into this little hallway like. Here's women stacked up, higher than I am, one on top of the other like cordwood. And I looked on around the side and the next pile, and they're stacked up the same way. On this side, the Japs use them for bayonetting. And they bayonet them all in the shoulder here. And on the other side, they bayonet them all in the stomach. Must have been there practicing both ways, you know. And they stacked them up dead like that. I don't stack them. <laughs> Dad Hahn, he said he was a news reporter. I, he never worked for them. He probably was a stringer. He came up to camp there after, after the Battle of Manila, you know, and he was talking to me. Well, he put a lot of stuff in that I never even said, you know. He, he made the inches <laughs> about me saying it was a Christian, there was no Christian war or something, which I never said. And uh, we got in there, and we walked down, and we got into the, the wall, on the wall, we went through the buildings, of course. And after we got there, we walked out, then we walked down the streets and leave here. What you did when you walked down the street, this guy is walking on this side, watch the windows on the buildings on that side, those guys on this side, watch the buildings on that side, for snipers, see. And at the same time, you're trying to watch for movie traps and stuff. So you're going up and down all the time. And uh, there was a, went by a string of buildings, and there was a, a big courtyard in the middle. And it looked like, you know, it had been from the first bombing when the Manila fell, because grass was growing in there. So they ran around the corner, and there was another church. So. I'm watching this way, but I don't have to watch too much because of the church, but I'm watching the steeples and stuff. And the other guys are going on that side. And I walk them along this wall, which is just the wall of a building, and the windows are there, but no windows are there, you know, and no room inside. And I, for some reason, as I'm walking, you're not walking fast, you know, you're looking. I got to that window, and somehow, I don't know what, I made a step backwards, just like somebody pushed me, and boom, they fired something through the thing. Well, it hit the guy across the road from me. This is just like an alleyway, because this is the old street, you know, you ain't gonna get no big cars down there. But it hit him in the back, and he had to go, he was out. 
But I can't understand why I made that step backwards just that that saved me from I got my head blown off there. Or got it into my head anyhow. And we kept on going down the road and we went into a blast and I like I said, I was loaded with all kinds of stuff. And on my pack I had a smoke grenade, a, a demolition grenade, and a phosphorus grenade. That's an extra pack strip on my leg, see. So we're going through these courtyards and buildings, and uh, this here guy, Mungai, his name was, we come to this thing, these buildings, they had that room off the courtyard, but there was no windows in it, see, it was to keep the place cool. Just the doorway. And Mungai says, I think I heard a sound in there. We were going to walk by, you know. We stood there, but we weren't going in because you go from sunlight, you ain't going to see nothing. And if they're in there, you're going to get it. He said, I thought I heard a sound. I said, well, let's go back and throw a grenade in. And he did. So then we heard a noise. So we knew somebody was in there. So, uh, the night before, we had been, after the part of the, you know, the battle in Manila, the part itself, then we went back to a place called Grace Park. And the other ones went to some other way, Kazan City, and the story book here tells you that they had swimming pools and that. We were out in the fields, which was a, uh, was a glass factory one time, and that building was all gone, you know? That's all. There was nothing there. And we got replacements. Well, then uh, we went into another place and had to go out again on an excursion. And when we came back again, they put us in a dance hall along the, the river. And the dance hall was built up off the ground, too. It was, but it was all hardwood floor. And just the big thing we rolled our channel hammocks down and slept on them, see? <coughs> but the point... <coughs> The point was when we had to go into the, uh, Manila again, we had breakfast about two o'clock in the morning underneath the building. And you know, you, always, you, you figure, I don't know what I'm going to eat again, maybe I better eat pretty good, you know. I learned that day, boy, don't do that. So we loaded on the trucks in the dark and went as far as they could into Manila in the dark. And they had, on all the buildings along the river, and on the street along the river, they had the biggest guns they got, the 155s, the 75s, all the day. On the top, they had guns, and the tank guns, everything that they could get, because you had to get them that wall. And uh, so they brought us in, and uh, we got out of their trucks and then walked. And we walked in these buildings, I laid on a pile of bricks, you know, what was once a building. That's when my breakfast started telling me that I should have ate easy. Oh, I felt like a lump mm. waiting for dawn, see. Yeah. And what they did is they had the uh, engineers bring up flat bottom boats, which they had made, and put them in a slip there. And they tied them up against the wall. And at the time, we had to go in and load. And I was in the second boat. But the artillery was blasting, you know, on the, like a canal, the rock walls from the water. Well, they had to blast a hole in one there, make it like steps so we could get up there, not climb, we couldn't climb up it. So they had a gun pounding that thing and breaking it so we could get up like a step way up. And the end of the building, the building we had was the mint, and you know how mints are built. So they kept pounding on the end of the building just to break the corner open. And this is what they did from dawn until we went. And kept going. So we got in the boats and we were sitting in there waiting for the signal to go. Well, nobody figured the tide. So we started out, loaded to the thing, and I figured if we ever get out on that way, if they, they drop any mortars in us, we go right to the bottom. You took too much weight. And the first boat starts out in the middle of the thing. Well, just below the water, about like that much, there's a piling. And then right out on top of it. And they're stuck. Well, we can't sit there. 
So we go first, we got to go, and everybody's going like this paddling. So I start going, yo, 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 and we got him going this way and got over there. Well, what you were supposed to do, somebody's supposed to grab the rope, tie it to something, and run up the bank, and get into the bank building quick, into the mint. Nobody was going to tie up the boat, they put the boat, let it float <laughs> down the river. <laughs> what they wanted to use it again, that was the point, I guess. So we got up there and went in there, and I'm telling you, these guys have been through a lot of them, and I see them when they got in that building, we started going around room to room. They were tossing their cookies, and they had been through some other stuff, but you see, it just hit, hit you right, you know, hits you wrong, rather. And uh, we dropped all our gear there then. And then the Army and Navy building was down farther, and we had to go up and go to that other cathedral. Well, as we're coming along this cathedral, and these big statues outside, they were made out of wood. I was surprised, all hand carved out of wood. This is a 16th century church. The walls are three feet thick. We're standing earthquakes and stuff. And there was a, a, I thought it was a Filipino laying on the lawn with a, a red robe on. And I thought, oh, he was trying to escape like a bishop. But I didn't realize it was a Filipino and he was a bishop. He was dead. And uh, that was, they talk about, remember the Royal Oak, Michigan here, that Father Cochran had that round church. They had him over there in the 16th century. That's what it was, a round church with an altar in the middle. Of course, no pews or anything was in the church. And then we from there we went into a, uh, the building and then I told you about the, uh, the uh, sound in the room. And then so when they did that, then I went back and I took my phosphorus grenade and I threw it in there. I thought, I'll drive them out. But you know, when that stuff hits you, it's, that's something. Well, Mike was coming around just through the hallway, like, you know, it's all the alleyway a little bit between buildings. And that Jack, I, all of my one guy and I are firing from the hip. All we see first was a bayonet coming out the door, you know? Well, Mike hit him head on, he hit him head on. And he just knocked him right back into the room. So we had to go to the end and that was, then there was an alleyway and then the, red, the wall was at the piers. So we had to get up on the piers, you know. Now it's, this is an all day thing we're going through. And uh, we got up there and it was just getting, just before dark there, thought we heard some noise and there was a pillbox there which the chaps had, it was a spider pillbox, they called it. It had four entrances, you know, just like this. And on top of it, they had sheep boiler plate, because they were down near the docks. See, there was a fields between us and then the docks were down there. And they had that so they could, air raids and stuff, you know, they were safe. So we thought we heard noise, and we, each guy covered up one of the entrances, you know, and put a few shots in there. All of a sudden, we heard bang, bang inside. They blew themselves up. So then we were going to open it up, make sure they were, you know. They put my hand down and they lift up one of these sheets of steel. I come up with a handful of meat. Yeah. I looked at it, I couldn't eat veal for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Must have been his legs, the meat from the leg, you know. And uh, so then I, I got up on the wall and I, my partner, meat, was down below. And I forget how high the wall was. But it's getting dark, so nobody really knew where anybody else was. But just as it's getting dark, at the end of the one building, the building part, the ground started moving. And we looked, and there a chap sticks his head out. They were crawling through the sewer. And then they said, they let him come out. And then another one come. So we're going to let him come out, see how many more come, you know? But it was only the two of them. So somebody opened up fire, and they hit him. But the one, the only wound, and now it's dark, and he's moaning and howling and jabbering in Japanese, whatever it was. And nobody on the wall wanted to fire because we didn't know where our own men went down there. You know, they were hugging the wall or the building or something, so you didn't dare shoot. Yeah. Finally, somebody down below, I wouldn't be a bit surprised it would me, opened it up, and it was quiet after that. Yeah. Yeah. So there we had that. And we had an officer one time, his name was Rains, he came from around New York City, Poughkeepsie. 
young guy. When we got him over there, he came unto us on Manila, and he was right out of camp, you know, and he was by the book, which was a mistake. He should have talked to the vets. He could have learned a lot or just listened to him. Because a lot of, we went through a lot of that war without even an officer, hard bunch. We lost them and never got replacements. And the captain used to come once in a while and go with us, or we'd go out on our own, and that's all. Well, and the thing, he was always by the book. Nobody liked that. So they used to call him Leather Lakes. And uh, I guess they transferred him out. They transferred him to a machine gun company in another platoon. So I, on Manila, I had to go back to that barn where we come over the bridge. They said they were serving hot food. So somebody would go back at a time and get the hot meals. See? So they had it inside, and we'd go in there, and they told us to take the meal and get out because they're putting mortars in here. So I sat outside. By that time, that bridge is secure, so they, you know, they had people looking for snipers. Around the corner comes this rains leading the men. I waved at them, you know, because I felt sorry for them. And uh, he smiled back, and he walked down there. And this one part of the wall, they were all built like arches, you know, when they were closed in. This one they had knocked open so they could go through from the city into the piers down there, see? Well, he takes his gun and crew down there, marching at the head of the line with him. He did a dumb thing. He, he had binoculars, and he must have been in the light. And he's scouting. And they shot him right in the forehead. Mm. Knocked him out. Which is a dumb thing too, you know. Hmm. Yeah. You only allowed one mistake, I guess. Yeah. So then we went back there and Oh, it was getting terrible. They would send up sandwiches. You had to put a mosquito net over your head because the blow flies from the dead bodies were so thick you couldn't get the sandwich up to your mouth before it was a bunch of flies. You could sneak it underneath and eat it. <laughs> and then in the afternoon, they're all lying on the wall and I watched the chap coming from the docks up. He was going to go for that opening. He probably didn't know we were there, see. And I kept saying, hold it, hold it, hold it. See, because that wall was like this, you know, how perfect it's like. Yeah, I don't know. And somebody down the other end got trigger happy when he was about halfway between us and the docks. And they fired shots. It must have hit him when he got wounded. Fell down. You know, the Japanese used to wear shoes with the toe is separate, the big toe. Mm -hmm. And then you had your toes in there. Well, he took his shoe off. He was laying on the ground, held his gun, took his toe, and pulled the trigger and killed himself. Hmm. I was hoping to close it, you know, they could have blasted him right out and they'd have been done. But I knew somebody would get through you happy. Yeah. yeah, they were, they had nowhere to go. They were totally surrounded at that point. They just yeah. wouldn't give up. Because then after that, when we packed up, went back again and did more replacements. You have to wait, then you have to go through a few drills, you know, to break them in. Yeah. That always bothered you because you never knew what a new one was going to do. You know, the old ones, you knew what they were going to do. They could fire right on the side of you, and you knew they were going to fire. They were going to hit you. And then you get new ones, and then they get trigger happy. You know, spoil the whole deal. Wait for them to get close. So, we pulled out here and got more replacements again. Then they come around when we were there. Oh, and when we went into that old section, the street we went down, there was one house on that side and one house on the other side, standing. Then there was the great big city hall tower, which the Japs had pretty well taken in. 
So we went down, everybody, there was a pillbox in the middle of the road. There was a road this way, and this was just one short block in the middle of the canal. The, the river was there, see? But this had been a bus barn, and it burned out. It was still burning on the riverside, the wall. And it was getting dark, and we had that, you know, I, I thought, oh, that damn fire was going to keep us right silhouetted all night long. We moved, the wall broke like this, cracked, you know, those bricks. So they went down that road, and that one building on that side, you know, before we went in there, our commander said to MacArthur, that was his part of the city, you know, he says, I ain't sending a man in there unless you put our children in. He wanted to save all the, the, the real estate, see? So they blasted the thing but good. But it's one house. It's hard to understand. They sent a patrol down there, and they came back, and they said the thing is loaded with stateside whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> so they sent a four by four down there, loaded it up, brought it back to this pillbox, which was a sad one, big round one in the middle of the street, the chap said. Loaded that in there, went back, had some more, I don't know how much they got out of there, and they come around, which was the officer shouldn't have done, I suppose, passed out that whiskey. One battle to every man. <laughs> then a court, you know, you're on a, on a front. This is during the actual battle itself? About a standing on the sand, you know, we dug it. Sweating like fools because there was, it was, the floor was all sand now. It might have been before it had been burned or something again, but it was all no concrete. The concrete was all gone. And it dug a, dug a fossil. So three of us would sleep and be in the foxhole. And uh, they each got their bottle, and I got mine, and I was like drinking Coca-Cola. Never found it. And I'm sweating and sweating. Well, what I did is I went and got a piece of uh, corrugated metal and put it behind me so I wouldn't silhouette it in that crack from the fire, see? And I'm standing on the sand, funny as they're scraping the sand, I'm standing on a whole pile of bus springs, red hot. That's why I didn't feel the whiskey. <laughs> You're on <of> it. <laughs> You're coming right out of them. <laughs> but when we pulled out of there then, well, we went up and, you know, uh, yeah, there was a building on the other side. We got up there, the captain went in that place, and there was, he went in the building and there was a big monkey. That one in the middle one, the big monkey, and it jumped on his shoulder. And that, that monkey wouldn't leave him after that. Stayed with him all the time. He let it too. But we didn't like it, because you go running by, the monkey jump on you and bite you. <laughs> so we figured, what, the next time, he's going to be missing. And he does. I don't know where he disappeared, but he's gone. So they said, there was me and the new kid. I don't know who he was. I don't even know his name and uh, two other guys. We had to go under the building, all you got is crawl space, and they had walls there, but they only had, they had windows, but no windows in, you know? So we went around the building, there was a dead chap laying there. And we went around, crawled in that window. Well, just before we go into the window, they had, oh, 10 foot high, must have been two inch thick gates, wooden gates. Before I went into the window, I took a great big rock and I moved it against that crate. Because we're on this side of the wall, the chaps are on that side of the wall. I think they're going to send patrols up. So we crawl under there. Then we take, I took the first watch, and then, oh, there was three of us to each window, that was it. Then we wake, uh, take one, that would make Instead of two at one time, you know, and it'd always be staggered. You'd always have a fresh man with the sleepy man, see? That was my own idea. I'd use that all the way along. So I get this kid, and he can't stay awake. And I keep nudging him, nudging him, trying to keep him awake, and he can't stay awake. But then Japs did come that night. And they come by the gate, and they pushed on it, and they couldn't get it open. So I don't know what happened alongside of the building because they were supposed to have a machine gun dug in out there. 
but they never fired a shot. So we weren't going to fire because, you know, we were going to get the worst of it. They charged grenades in there. We couldn't see them anyhow. So the next morning, send that kid out for breakfast, and he never came back. And I asked about him. He said he was sick. They sent him to the hospital. <laughs> when you see that chap was laying by the window in the back of the building, and all that sweet smell was drifting through there all night long, and it made him sick. <laughs> he couldn't take it. <laughs> and we got out of there, and we ran in the back. Somebody else relieved us. So that, that body was smelling so much. Dug around in his house, and he come up with a bottle of cologne. Shave, you know, men's shaving cologne. So, and then the building on the side was, a, or might have been a religious dealer. He had a shed in the back and he had statues and uh, embroidery there and all that stuff, you know, which the statues were all probably nicked by bullets anyhow, and stamps. And he had a lot of rosaries and medals and stuff like that. So in his place, we got these cloths and we wrapped them around our heads, you know, so you didn't smell them. And then got the, a door and put that chap on the door and then run in the back of the building and dug a hole and bury him. Well, we still smelled, so then we sprayed this cologne all over the grave. <laughs> <laughs> but we had our slit trenches there, because the chaps on the other thing, as soon as they put a mortar in, you could hear the pop. So you hit the slit trench, you know. And uh, other times, when then you didn't bother, you just stood outside. And over against that wall where that place where the, the statuary was, there was these two boxes. So when I got home here, the hand carved one, and the other one was a small box about that big, lacquered. Nice, nice job. So I went over and got one. I thought, if we go forward, I'll forget it. If we go back, I'll take it with me. And I went over and I scooped up all them stamps and put them in the box. Didn't know one from another. And we brought them home. Dead box too. Well, from there we went back to that dance hall that our thing, and they come along, and they give three bottles of whiskey to every two guys. And that, <laughs> See, that was just, still <laughs> and that, Can you imagine how much whiskey was in that well, building? <laughs> I'm telling you, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That was terrific. And that was the only one that survived in that whole street, on that side of the street. Huh? That was the only building that still survived on that side. Yeah, it, you know, it was uncanny. <laughs> They're blowing clear on this side and blowing clear on that side, and there's a square big building, this house, about two stories, I think, two or three stories. <laughs> and a sack with stateside whiskey. <laughs> now, where the hell did you capture all that stateside whiskey? You couldn't have been from the Army and Navy Club that many years. No, I'm sure it would have disappeared. <laughs> Because I remember the bottle I had in the fire, Mr. Boston. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but then it's the same old story, you know. Go back somewhere and get replacements and go and get something next. Was that, the, was that the battle where you had the, the mortar fire was two, they were just on one side of the wall and you were on the other? So yeah. They couldn't actually hit you because the mortars wouldn't come down. Well, they would go up and they would land, but not right with us, you know was back, but they, they didn't know which, actually if there was more behind us or not, see, so they were putting out and then we put over there too. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, uh, I don't know how that would have went, but then we had to pull out of there, see, at that city hall, they were trying to, sh another division on the other side was trying to, to, uh, drive them out of there and they were using big cannon and they would hit the building and careen off, ricochet, see different things going like this and whistling, you know, and hoping they're not going to land on you. <laughs> so they pulled us back for a couple of hours and then shelled the hell out of it. <laughs> and then by that time we got relieved to come back again. So from there all your fighting went inland a little bit then? Huh? You went into the jungles again after that or? No, there wasn't too much jungle there. 
was mountains. Mm -hmm. No, they sent us up to the north part. Well, we went through the middle of the island, you know, one city after another and town after another. And uh, <coughs> this place, Tarlac, pictures are in here. It's just wiped out, you know. Somebody said they got a report that there was chaps coming down the railroad. So up we, you know, we were in another town. We had to get over there. And we dug in the field near the railroad, did the trench for the night in soil. Paper mine, no. And uh, mailed it. Mm -hmm. I dug the sled trench, I laid down, and I, I and to me, I had got a, a, a stiletto, not a hunting knife. You know, they were giving hunting knives out. I picked a stiletto. It had a Sheffield steel. A uh, deer bone handle. It was a beauty. I always had it strapped on me. And at night I would take it and then just my arms lank, I'd dig it in the ground like that, you know, in case I had to grab it in the dark. So it was during the night we had a, a, a try to meet some chaps coming up a road. So you let them go. But before that, I got dug that slip trench, I'm laying in it, it's dark, dark. And a frog jumped in there. Well, I don't know who jumped the highest after that, me or the frog. <laughs> you know, you're laying there looking at the sky and all of a sudden something flops out of you. Oh, brother. Didn't that happen with a tarantula somewhere too? Huh? Didn't that happen with a tarantula somewhere too in the Amazon? Yeah, over in Bougainville. It landed on your chest and... <laughs> what is that? Scorpion. Scorpion. Yeah, I sweated that one out. I'm finally running around in circles on my chest, you know. I mean, if he goes to the face, I'm going to swat, no matter what. If he goes down my leg, I'll forget him. He went down my leg. Because I didn't want his old tail going and start slashing me. So you lost the stiletto when you moved? So, yeah. I had to leave in a hurry. I grabbed up my rifle and my equipment and put it out and rent, and I'm starting to move out. I forgot all about the darn knife. Some Filipino got it. Got it. Oh, that, I was sorry to leave that. That was a good knife. And then we, more junk. We then from there we went after Manila. We went up, way up along the coast, way up to a place called. Uh, I remember it was. There's another name in another town. It was to protect the harbor there where we had landed originally. So we were all the way back up there beyond. And it was called Carlton because that was the kid that wanted to join the Navy that I told to wait. His name was Carlton, that's why I remember it. And we were there. Well, the trouble there was the little kids. The Japs had dropped, uh, uh, what do you call booby traps. They looked like pens, but there was a long thread on them. You know, and they would we were hanging in the trees and there'd be bushes and the kids would grab them. They'd blow their hands off, lose their fingers. So we stayed there for a while, not long, and asked that, that woman, guerrilla leader, did you read about or heard about? I see her there. She was a hard looking character, just like Pat, two revolvers on her hips, you know. And then we went from there, we had to go over it a little bit and then the, when we landed in Lingayen Gulf, I think we were the White Beach, and the Red Beach was up here, and Blue Beach was down farther, see? So we were in the middle. In this Red Beach, I trained with a lot of them guys in South Carolina, and they were in that division, the 25th, and they weren't getting anywhere. They were building a road to get into Baguio, through the mountains, and they were moving and moving and moving. We went all the way down, had all the battles down in Manila, Fort Stassenberg, Clark Field, and uh, came back and went to Santa Fe and got uh, re-outfitted, came back all the way up there, thing, and they were still fighting and were in the bay. So they take us and attach us to, uh, I think it was the 33rd Division, which was going up Route 9, and they put us on Route 5, to go up there, and that was a zigzag road to Baguio like this. 
up in the mountains. Where I climbed mountains that I never thought I'd, I wouldn't look at today, you know. I remember going up on the top of this one mountain, just before Baguio. We crawled up there, we had to hang on bushes and everything else to get up on that thing. We got up to the top, there was another outfit in trouble over there, so we had to go and give relief. So we uh, went through their lines, went down below into a ravine, covered with willows and stuff, hacked our way through to get the Japs from the side, take the pressure off these guys, you know. I see some guys come out of there, and this was another company, you know, and they were, you know, we got up there and then they were starting to bring their casualties up. One guy went by and I was laying in a ditch like a wash, you know, when the rain washes. So we got out of the ditch, let the stretcher bearers come out. I looked at this guy going by. He looked like marble. He was white and purple. I didn't think he had a chance. He lived. I didn't think he had a chance. You know, the color of them. So we went over and up to their line on top and then took his route over and hit the Japs from the side. Took the pressure off of them. And then we came back and went in the thing so they were going to send patrols out. Now I'm not a bazooka man, I'm a scout to lead off, to play pigeon on the front. So we go out. This is reconnaissance. No fighter fighter, you can avoid it, see? So I lead off, take the path that we're supposed to go, try to find out what's going on, where they are, and they come to a hill. This is up in the mountains, but there's like dirt hills come on top of the peaks too. I stopped that draw, and I did, what made it on, on that cliff on top, there was a log laying there. And I was suspicious of that, you know? Because it was too clean, that log. It wasn't just a lot of branches hanging on it or anything. It was a log, tree log. Now I ended up and I ended up, and Meek was my second scout. And I said to him, what do you think, you know? And I had the whole squad squat down. And uh, he says, well, you run across, I'll watch it. You know, he, and he was a squirrel hunter from Tennessee. He could hit anything. And I was glad to have him behind me. So he anyway, watched it. I ran across. I got over. So it was maybe from, I was wide as this room. And then you had another cliff going up, see. So, okay, so I keep watching. Now I'm watching the law. And looking at, trying to look at this draw, you know, at the same time. And so you'll need to come. He starts running across and the jack pops up on the, on the, between the things there, back father, sitting in the tall grass and he didn't see him. He's supposed to be on guard duty, see. He didn't know it, but the mortar squad's right down below him in the thing. <coughs> so he's, he's gonna fire. So his cap, he gets up and he shoots at the, the jack. Well, the jack took off. So now they knew we were there, you know. Okay, so we had to pull back out. We didn't have no officer. We only had the sergeant, see. He, he was, wasn't our sergeant, really. But you know, they make do. When you lose them, you gotta make do. He got back, and when we got back, we went back on the trail a little bit. And then we went back into the camp to report that we made contact. I'm madder than what hand and I go over there and I ball that sergeant out right and left. I don't care who, whose rank is what or anything. Even the captain I used to argue with. <laughs> Maybe because I was older they took it, I don't know. I could have been court martial, I guess. Anyhow, I shoot him out but good. So he gets in with me. So they said we gotta go out again. And he says, Roland, you're the point. I lean into him again. <laughs> I'm being wet, you know, you're nervous out there, sweating like a fool. So we had to go up that trail part of the way, and then take another trail down. So we did that. We go down this bank, there's a flat piece there, we crawl out, and we can look over to the thing, and here's the chaps got their motor set on a flat place down there. Caves in the wall. Somebody shoved their head out too far, and somebody saw them down below. 
somebody had pull out, pull out. So we go up that hill again. This is a good climb. Mike's ahead of me, and we're only this far apart. And there's a motor lands in between the two of us, and never touched either one of us. I can see the big flash. That was it. Never touched us. You see, sometimes when them things go like, like this, you can be far away and get hurt from it. But if you're right near, if you get in that arch, if it hits right, you don't get touched. And that's what happened. I couldn't believe it. We pulled down the trail a little bit and uh, laid along the trail and set up an ambush. People were really going to follow us, you know, send out a patrol after us. Because the motor men ain't going to come. And this one new recruit we had, we just picked up in a coconut grove along the beach when we were in that other place. He goes there, lays on to the side of the trail like this against the bank, takes off his helmet, puts his gun down, and I'm up, geez, you know, now with a couple of trips like that, you tight. I go over to him and I start chewing him out. And he buys place for that. I want everybody I can have, you know. I asked him if he thought he was on a picnic. I told him to put that damn helmet on and pick up that gun and never leave it go and leave his side. Keep it with you at all times. He didn't know what to say. New, you know, brand new. And he was from Buffalo. <laughs> I found out later. So Mike is sitting there watching and off to our side just a little bit where we met. There had been a, either a Jap post or a deserter. There was stuff in there and clothes and stuff like that. I think it might have been a deserter. So Mike's watching that trail, and sure enough, here comes a jack down there. So Mike pops up, and Mike was funny when he was shooting. He used to be an amateur boxer. He'd always dance. And he's going, bing, 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 and he's dancing at the same time, and shoot. He knocked him out. <laughs> so he went back, and then they said, they were, uh, we get cold in the mountains at night, you know, it would be hot and out during the day, and then it got cold at night, so they said the 33rd was going to send, which is the ones we were attached to, we are going to send up jackets for us, and you could go and get them. Well, I found another guy to go down and bring two up. I didn't want to go and figure that, that climb that mountain again. But then later on, they come along and says, the priest will hold, the chaplain, you know, Father Andy would hold mass down below, I'm back at this mountain. There would have been a greenhouse, but it was all blown out. Just the frame was there, all the glass all over. And anybody went to go to mass could go to mass. So I go to mass. I thought of it twice, though, you know. But I figured I owed them that day twice. <laughs> <laughs> go down, crawl, and go to the mass. You know, always carry a rifle and that's how long. So I bang, bang, bang going on. And he stay in mass. And we come back and go up. Well, they had made calls, for, and the other outfit alongside of us called for napalm bombing in the valley. You know, and then planes swooped in and dropped in bombs and had that whoosh. So one failed to make the, the drop. The thing hung down. It didn't drop, though, the bomb. This was a regular bomb. So we got these streamers sticking on the ground, you know, to show our position. You know, they watch for the red streamers or whatever the color you got that day. And he went to pass and just greet us, and the bomb falls off. <laughs> <laughs> but over there, great big boulders that was sitting on top of the ground. And when I came back up from the mass down there, there was only that much of it sticking out of the ground. It went way up in the air and come down with such force that it sucked way down on the ground. <laughs> Get hit on the, on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, that was really a time. <laughs> but then we had that, it was quite a good thing. You had to get back to work. Yeah. Eventually. Eventually, but now, yeah. Is that where you really had the, the mortar shell hit you? I remember you told me once that one almost got you in the head. And you saw one. No, I remember the other place. Where? Fort Stotzenberg. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So after Clark Field, we went through Clark Field, Fort Stotzenberg. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, he was, you know, that was a, a night, that was the day we left. I told you about that, about the, the rations and so forth. Where you got the can of peas, <coughs> only can of peas or something like that? Well, you, you, I got a can of bacon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> bacon. Can of peas. You know, it is, uh, what do you call it, the, the color? Khaki color. Yeah. So you don't know what you're getting, just a can. And then that, that day when we pushed off, that was a tragic day in a way. We had a, a tank destroyer with us. And uh, we were on this ridge in the, during the night when we were peppered by snipers, but they had to pull out in the morning, and that's how I got that can, you know. They came up late with the rations, which was supposed to be for all day, 10 and 1. So they just ripped open the box, and when you run by, you were supposed to grab some. Well, they, and that's what I did. I grabbed, <laughs> put it in my cargo path, you know. And the other guy, he, he did the same. He, I don't remember who he was. And uh, we go up there, start off. All right, the tank goes off, and we're on, this was part rice fields up there. And I don't know if they had a new gunner in there anyhow, but anyhow, he's, we're starting off, so when we start, the troops are out in front of them to go down this valley and go up on the ridge on the other side, we're going on this side. And he opens fire with the machine gun, and he starts blowing our own men down. You know, when the thing tipped like this, it went over, you know, dropped. And they start blowing our own men down. So that was the bad start. And, uh, we started and we went over and there was just a footpath. The darn uh, machine gun somewhere opened up so you dove in the grass, you know, and that's when I hit the Lord and went through the woods. I went right through it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm telling you. Well, I rolled over at the same time because, you know, I had my left hand, my left arm out to break my fall. I had my rifle on the right. That's how I, whoosh, right into the pile. You know, it was a round circle that they had used straight on top of the ground. And I swear we were all that dysentery. <laughs> well, I slid right through it pretty good, though. And then I rolled over, you know, because I can somebody's probably where I land, they're going to start peppering with fire. So you, you roll over and get out of that same position. Well, I only had it, they must have been firing tracer bullets. So it started the, the grass on fire behind us. So the wind was blowing on our back. So it was a rapid advance, and we either get burned or they found shooting, and we carried her down that thing, violent in it. And we covered everything like that, you know, every once in a while you see a cave down below, send a few down here to look it over. Figures, you know, if there's any they can get it, and if there ain't, they're gone. And uh, we went on this in, on, on top of the crest, which was our uh, destination for that day, you know, to get that ridge. Because you had top of the world was the high mountains where the, where the big guns were, and we tried to find them. And uh, so we dug it, actually trenches here, and all of a sudden the shots start popping off. And everybody's ducking and looking where they're coming from, and you can't figure it out. There was a couple jacks down there were burning, and their country spells were going on, and they were popping. Yeah. So this guy and I, we said, decided we were going to eat. So that's when I found out I had bacon. Well, he ain't going to eat raw bacon. And he opened up his, and it was peas, so we had cold peas between us, that's all. That's from the morning. Yeah. No eating all day. And then they decided to change our position. Under the cut, start the southern. They put our mortar section down below this hill. You know, we're on the top like this. It's a slope. And what did they do? Somebody, and they claimed it wasn't ours. Artillery opened up and sent the salvo in there. And generally, when they try for a target, they send one. They send the whole salvo and they wiped out our own mortar section. Blew them right out. So then, they, in the cover of darkness, I had to go around the front with two guys two movements that bothered me. That was the night when I, before that, we were on top of the crit arc, digging, and I was thinking that was right on the peak of the drop, right down. And they, it looked like they might have had a machine gun there because there was planks there. And I could hear Jack down below in the cave, way down, you know, it was quite a ways down. But 
the ground, you know how the ground washes down from ravines and added like a hill? There was a draw like that there. But ours was up like this, and there's a going down. So when I had these two guys with me, now one guy was transferred from tank, and you couldn't, I know, he, he was highly, he stuttered, stuttered, but you know, what are you gonna do with a guy in the battle? You can't understand him, he, he, he can't say nothing. He's, that's all. And the other guy was new and I never worked with him. So we stand there, and I, on the end, and just a slit trench. So I did the same thing. I says, we take watches, I want two, two of us on that watch at the same time. Because the road is down there, the Japs are in that mountain. There's a, there's a light down there, there's a doorway on the bottom of that mountain. I said, now don't, that guy walking back and forth with a lantern, don't let him distract you. Don't, he's too far away anyhow. I know he's either checking mines or he's laying them or he's just doing this to distract us. And I said, that banana tree out in front, don't keep staring at it because if you do, it's gonna move. You know, karma, I figure it's a karma flight. So I watched the other two slip because we're going from daylight, you know. And then I woke one up. So I was in my second hour and the other guy was new in the first hour. And it was this year, Mungai, not Mungai, uh, what the hell is it, the eye back. It was him. So, okay, so I take my belt off, which I shouldn't have done, my rifle belt, and laid it down on the ground because you, you know, we had in the jungle carry two canteens and used them for a pillow, my canteens to lay my head on. And uh, I'm sleeping there. And I was shaking. Actually, you wake up quick, you know, and this guy, I brag, and this other guy's on watch now with him, see? And he says, I think we heard something. Well, you don't want to fire at night if you can help it, because as you're flashing your gun, it's going to give you your position away, and you're going to get it. So I said to him, well, you think you saw something, throw a grenade. And I no sooner said that, and the mortar come in. Bingo, right in between us all. And at the meantime, the sergeant from another bunch would come around the turn and see what was going on. And he was standing on the hill beside me. And that thing went off in between us, right in the middle. I blacked out. I see a big flash, you know, and I, I, black, I didn't really, I don't know what you call it, blackout. I knew what was going on. I could hear everything, but I couldn't see. So I heard this moan. And when I could see, nobody was there with me. Everybody was gone. So I crawled on my belly, but I was crawling backwards because the Japs knew that trench. They had been in it, and they were dropping mortar after mortar, trying to hit that trench, see, and I'm there. And I'm moving, I gotta keep moving just so fast to keep ahead of them, because they're using knee mortars, you know? And he's gauging it like this. And I grabbed a bag, thing that was an ammunition bag. And I pulled it along with me, because, you know, they had my ammunition, because I had mine in clips and by then in my bag. <clears throat> and I get to the, like, it went like this, and then it went around the corner to another peak there, see, like an L. And I'm crawling backwards, and I get tangled up with somebody. And it's this bell, the, guy, the sergeant that came around in the corner, he got hit in the chest, and I didn't think he had a monkey's chance, because I could hear him like leaving the air out of the tires right out of his chest. And I reached in that bag to get some ammunition, and it wasn't my bag, and it was full of sea rations. All I got is the clip in my gun. I ain't got my belt on. So I said to Mel, I think they're coming. I'm gonna fire this clip. What I'm firing, give you cover. Can you get around the corner? There's three guys there that'll take care of you. So he, he understood me. He wasn't out then. Because I stood up and I fired. And he ran around the corner and these guys grabbed him right away, you know, and then they got him back to the medics. It's in the night, they sent up a half track and took him to a hospital. But he was wheezed out and they gave me a nickel for him. And I didn't know what happened to the other two guys. They told me they sent him back to the medics too. 
So I fired, and there, below me, below these guys here, there was supposed to be a machine gun, but they never fired a shot. Now maybe they held their fire too because they didn't see nobody. But they were on the slope, they should have seen everybody. They should have seen the whole thing before it ever started. So I laid, I went there and I laid on that bank and I laid on an angle like this because my stomach was like I had a rock. And I laid upside down. I don't know why, but I did. And I felt my shirt was so wet. So I turned around and I said to one of the guys, I don't remember who they were, I'm gonna pull my shirt down, look at my back, will you? And he says, oh, your shirt's all wet. Well, I knew it was wet, I could feel it, but I didn't know I was just sweating. He says, oh, you got some cuts on your back. The day ain't too bad, he says, but you better go back to the medics. And I got nothing doing. Because I didn't want no, go back and then they send a word to your mother that I got a purple heart, so don't worry the hell out of her. And that wasn't that much for me, because I didn't feel it. And I thought, they hit my canteen. Well, I wasn't wearing the canteen. It was his Mel's blood. Mm. I was soaked with it. <laughs> so I laid there during the night, and the next morning there was a little stream down there about that deep. And I just laid it with the clothes and let the whole blood wash out. And uh, he made it. And I never knew what happened to the other two guys. Well, the one, you know, the stutter, and the other one, he was in another squad. He had been with us for a little while. Until the other night, no, this one I think. I'm looking in the book, and they must have put him in the service company. He's driving a Jeep, taking the wounded out. <laughs> I looked at him and said, there he is, I back. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Try to say. And there he is. But wasn't there one action, daylight action though, where you watched a mortar shell coming in? And they landed oh, in the well that, no, that was the night when it came in. See, when I tangled legs with him, going around that turn, we were anchored. Well, them my shells, they were still dropping mortars to me. And I looked up when I told them, you know, I was stranded. I didn't know who I was with, really. And I figured it was somebody that, one of them guys. I looked up and I could see it was, they had a silver casing on spinning in the moonlight, see? And it's coming down. Luckily, it didn't hit on the nose. It was only about a foot and a half away from my head. But it, would, it turned to be a dud, see, it didn't hit on the nose. It spiraled. It was enough for me when I got him out of there. Well, the next morning they sent some out there in front. The officer went out to check that where the action was. And I think that, I don't know if it was going to be a raid or not, but there was a ca Japanese captain and a Japanese lieutenant laying there. And I only fired eight shots and there was two guys. And because it was the commanders, maybe the soldiers pulled back out, unless they were out reconnoitering on their own. Is that the action you won the Bronze Star for? No, that was another thing. What was that? Was that, was that, was that the Battle of Manila? Or? No, that was up in a mountain somewhere, I think. I don't remember where. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't impress you much? Or up the Kagan Valley, I think, somewhere around there. You know, after that, that place there, then we got pulled back and same old thing, outfit net, and the 30, or 25th Division was stuck at Belidi Pass, they call it, Santa Fe. There's a lot of Santa Fe's, they're all different provinces, like we got counties, they got provinces. So they were gonna decided that they always picked on K, because they, you know, showed themselves in Bowling Bell and that, and they, they always figured they could knock them through. I don't know, I think they kept in my eyes, thought it was, he always thrived on smoke, gun smoke, I think. <laughs> but anyhow, it was always key. So they figured they were going to send us through there, and we only had to go to the next town. Because they were stalled there for I don't know how long. So they, we come up in the morning the same way, you know, go early and go through. These guys are lined up, laying there, holding their positions, and we walk through them and then on its hours. And uh, we got to that city, the next town, so quick that they decided we'll keep going. So we went faster, farther, and we kept going faster and faster. They had put two other outfits, one on the ridge on this side, one on the ridge on that side, you know, on the mountain side, so they, 
the one on the roadway, that's what they wanted for armor. So we start going up that thing so fast, we had to wait once in a while for the other ones to catch up with us. But they wouldn't stop. And uh, we went up that valley, held them for election. They would set up the artillery before they could fire. We were still our fire in advance, they had to knock it down, you know, they used to bulldoze spots and move up again. <laughs> <laughs> so they used to try to even move ahead of us so we'd, we'd go by and they'd be ready. Well, one night they pulled up like that. We've been shaking them. See now, this broke up a big drive. And these other places that were getting wet, they were trying to assemble in one big area and make a big force out of it. And by this fast driving, they got footnotes in there. Yamashita said he couldn't understand what was going on, and they weren't giving him a chance to set up anywhere. And he says, pretty soon he was losing all his contact with his outfits. They weren't going into the places they were supposed to be when they were supposed to be at the date that they were. So we weren't giving them a chance to set up. They would just set up tanks when they run out of gas or something like that and put them in a place where they'll leave some bunch to harass you on and keep you, delay you, you know. <clears throat> so they got up there so fast. And... Uh, uh, all the way around, and there we went up to the, the uh, route and went right up to a parry, which is the northern part of the island. It used to be an airfield, and then there was just bomb craters and jet planes on the ground and all that stuff, all sand dunes, you know, and the bomb craters are so big we used to just take a plane and push it in there and they bulldoze it shut. That's so where we made our base. <clears throat> then we had to come back down again and then start out into the hills. And they go up in that darn hills. They were only footpaths, so we needed supplies. You needed artillery. And that's where the Japs were trying to assemble again up in the mountains, way up on the other end of the mountains. And uh, they were, the CBs were building the road be as we were going up. And then they had these dump trucks come in with gravel from the creeks, you know, and backing up and dumping the gravel and making a road as we were going up. Well, this one night we got so far and they had the, the artillery there and our mess tent was right alongside. And they decided to cover the halls because these guys were getting wore out, digging in and digging out. <laughs> so they set up the line and we were supposed to give them protection. I don't know if there was something in the area at the time that they thought might come after them. And every, at intervals during the night, they would fire, you know, to harass them if they were trying to move down the road. But I was, I was sleeping behind the mess tent, behind a lot of cases, you know, on the ground. And you hear this, fire! And I, bang! And I, up off the ground, you know, and I come down. <laughs> I raised right off the ground. And that was going on all night. And then I knew the lieutenant that was doing it. I, I met him in Shanks, and uh, right, that was going on all night long like that. So you know, every time you, they'd fire around, you'd raise off the ground. <laughs> and then the Japs were firing back, but they were firing way over us because the stupid division set up their headquarters behind us, figuring they're safe, and they put lights up. And the Japs had long enough range right, uh, cannon <laughs> he blasted that place down there and made them all scurry for cover. <laughs> then lights went out fast. <laughs> so we got up there and we got into the mountains and we went up that trail and uh, then we got the word that there was a possible uh, treaty and, you know, uh, that there was talk of surrender, but it was nothing official yet. So we were sending out patrols, but they told us no more, you know, hold, sit still. Don't go out looking for anything. And I, I was, in a way, I wanted to go over, Father, because there was a waterfall over there, and I talked to one of the natives. He told me that's where the gold mines were, where the waterfall was. But I found out they were flooded anyhow. But he told me on this side of the mountains and mountains over there, it was called the Sierra Madrid Mountains, that there was people with little pygmy people with tails. And I wanted to see that, <laughs> but we never got there. 
I took a patrol out one time looking for fresh water. I met patrol myself and I, the guy, he was a, he lived in Manila. He was a college guy. Him and his wife and his sister-in-law were there and you know, they had to build up huts along the river, river there and they were waiting out the war. And uh, he went out with me, you know, and I went up this way and that water was muddy. Muddy didn't know what we had. So I went down the river and he had this brackish, but it wasn't muddy. But up above where these shacks were, they had all the caribou tied in the water. You <laughs> know, they were sitting in there. <laughs> so I went back and we got a, a cat and put a trailer on it filled it full of five gallon cans and I rode shotgun and we went down there and we filled up these five gallon cans with water and brought them back and uh, doused them with chlorine you know to make them come up to the standard yellow color and that's what we were drinking so we waited and then finally it said that they were going to bring in a, a party you know a peace party so I decided that night on my own that I would like to sleep on a cot back in base camp. There's nobody back there but one guy. He's watching the service club. <laughs> so the Jeep driver's going back, and I says, give me a ride back to camp, will you? Yeah, he did. I go back. I didn't ask anybody if I could go. I went. <laughs> so I'm up there, and I go down to the serviceman's tent. The guy and I have a few drinks. <laughs> I go back, and in the morning I hear that yeah, it's 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 fine. It's so they are seeking peace, and it was August fifteenth. I remember it. So there's other outfits around there, you know. Not our battalion is, uh, is there. Red, other parts of the regiment is still there. So they had a, the the, the, the padre was going to hold mass in there at a tent, which they had for mass. So I went over there. And boy, I choked up on that one because I didn't think, it, I think that my luck was going to run out because I know our next move was from Osa. That was our next place to go. Mm. Now, it wasn't Japan like the others were going or something. We were going to Formosa. And I, you know, so there we, had, we had some old guys left. Some of them were going home on rotation, so we, they were going ahead. But a lot of them weren't there anymore. Mm. And you know, you figure, how long is your luck going to hold? What was the action that you won the Brown Star for, though? Huh? What was the action that you won the Brown Star for? I think it was around the valley. It's in this book here. Was it a unit? You want to look at that? Yeah, well, was it a unit type thing? Yeah, or? yeah I mean, you know, sometimes they, they, they think they're good. Other times you can get yourself in one hell of a mess and nobody sees anything and you don't get up. But you see what happened there. We never... I was a PFC. The guys that were sergeants were sergeants. They weren't made first sergeants. They weren't made nothing. Because we weren't getting any ratings. You couldn't get a rating. You know, like after so long, you get a rating. And because they were giving them out right and left in Europe, and that kiboshed the whole thing. They're, they probably stopped it over there too, but there was too many. Yeah. So everything was froze. So you could do a lot of things. Didn't need anything. So they decided to pick something out and say, Oh, that was pretty good. Maybe you ought to get a medal for it. Oh, <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. you. Turn that off. Well, I'll, see, I'll see if I can find it in here. Well, while you're, while you're looking, tell me about. So the peace came while you were in the northern part of the island. Then. Well, when I was on the island, then there was talk, see? So I had to go back to that camp again, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, there, was a, there was a house there, and there was a big barn, and that was a, a tobacco plantation. So there were a lot of bamboo slits around there, you know. So we set up two tents. And uh, uh, we waited for the, the, the party to come in. Sure enough, they come in. The, the uh, officer, I don't know what his rank was, he was some big weak. So they had the natives build a, a little thatched roof place and a bamboo floor about that high off the ground. Nothing else, you know. 
holds it's all. So here this guy comes like here, he goes riding on a white horse. The rest of them are walking. This is this is a group, you know. There was only about oh maybe a dozen. And one of them was a tall, lanky chap, which you don't see too many of, you know. And he comes in and we stand in there. And he hands one of the guys his pistol. He had a nice one. I would have wished he had been up a little farther so I could have got it. It was nickel-plated, pearl-handled, little twenty-two like pistol. He says, I know they're going to take it away from me. You might as well have it. English! <laughs> well, I talked to him later. He went to Holy Cross University. He says, I don't know how true it is. I don't know how he got in the army. But he says he went back to visit his grandparents in Japan. War broke out. They wouldn't let him come back home. Well, I don't know how they, maybe they forced him into the army. I don't know how. He was an American citizen. I don't know if he was an American citizen. I didn't ask him that. But he was studying the Holy Cross thing. So he was very good. So this, this uh, commander that came in on the white horse, you know, young guy, you know, but he's like the rest of the Japanese commanders. And he sits up there like Buddha. You know, legs crossed, sits there, and they all, all come to him, and they, like this, you know, bow first, you gotta bow. So they had a kid with him, he was a flunky, I guess, I don't know what the hell he was. He was about 15, 16 years old. And he, he knew some English. Oh boy, but he couldn't murder it. He knew he had all the slurs to it, you know, they can't say R. And, uh, oh, he was half English, half you know, and everything he'd have to serve his food, take the food to this general name. And we got him on the side and we were told, the war's over, you don't have to bow to him, you don't have to do that stuff, he ain't God, you know? And he was a little bit leery and pretty soon was up at the tray, you don't even bother bowing. I bet when he got back to camp, he got his ass kicked <laughs> off. He <laughs> wouldn't bow. Because he had to go back with the party. See, they made arrangements to bring the sick and the wounded out first. And then the other ones come. They put them in prison. But that kid was funny. <laughs> yeah, pictures are in here or there. In there, I guess. The Cleveland kid was a tank. And uh, we had got in the bag, you know, and we were uh, going to stay there and get hot food. And this other outfit on the mountaintop was having problems. So they take a bunch of us and they go up there to, to stretch the line along the ridge, you know, for the night. And uh, there was the same way, they'd dig a slit trench and then they decided they'd take us down and put us alongside the tank on the road. So we went down to the tank and the room was stretched out. Well, this creek was dry, but you know what? The monsoon season, these things are great big rivers. But at the dry season, they get down water trickling over pebbles, you know. So was, they got a pier built out to the end of this building, and I imagine it was a pumping station, just a little square brick building, see? There was another one of the situations. And the tank was back here in the steep mountain that way. And it was cut up, see? In the morning, one of them chaps jumped off of there with a satchel charge on him, tied on him. And he tried to get to the tank when the tank started to move, you know. But somebody picked him off before, so it didn't do nothing to the tank. But it was the Cleveland kid was the tank. They were good guys to work with. So then that night, we stretched out along this thing. But it was higher, you know, about uh, eight foot tall. You had to stand on something to look over the top of it. And it was a little wider than a driveway. So that's what they used to use for, I figured, a pumping station. So we were on this side and the Japs are on the other side of that thing again. Right? <laughs> One to the other. So we were laying on down, down and then this might be always in something. Here's another guy laying under a shelter half, see, trying to get some sleep. And uh, all of a sudden this firing starts, you know, and the mortars come in. 
and it's, all I can see is the shutter hat going wiggling down like a bird in the breeze, you know, they're underneath trying to crawl. <laughs> it was funny. So the next day we go up again, you know, we got down the road with the tank. We were supposed to protect the tank. We were stretched from the tank and then from us, there was guys stretched out up in the hill. So going down that thing, the road, you know, valley is that now? I think today, I forget what it is. It's a valley, you know, and then there's a mountain start on the other end again. Santa Fe is the town down there. San Fernando is the town down there. And uh, we start down that way, and every now and then you, know, you get held up by sniper fire or machine gun fire somewhere, and you have to wait for them guys to hunt them out. So Meek and I are walking on top of this bank. You know, just after we left the pass at the Baguio, and we get down there, and somebody on the other side's got problems, so we hold up. And uh, he and I decide it's time to eat. So we jump over the bank, is about three feet tall, and sit down there and start eating. You know, open up a can of sea ration. For you eat now, you don't know what's coming later, what you're gonna eat. And up on this mountainside, there's a brown spot. And I says to my, you know, to the meek, we're sitting there eating, and I said, hey meek, do you think you can hit that from here? You know, he's that Tennessee mountaineer. He takes draws a beat, and I can see the chips fly right in that brown spot. Oh, that guy was a whiz. So then we started down the valley again, you know, and then threw a lot of this trouble in the action, like my rifle was dirty, and I didn't want, want to know if it was gonna fire all right or if it was gonna foul up on me, you know? I didn't have a chance to clean it. So I had armor piercing, piercing shells in the clips, and then the clips were starting to even get rusty, you know, you had to always clean them off with oil every to get a chance. So I thought, I'll shut one in and see how it works. And they had their telephone poles, their electric poles. And they're about three inches square, and they're around, and they're pipe, and solidy. So I take an aim at one and I fire. And it pierces, well the thing must have been full of water and it keeps spurting water <laughs> till it drained. <laughs> I knew the gun worked then. <laughs> and at the same time, that armor piece Clean the barrel out good for me, see? Well, we had some guys, there's one guy going along there, and he would, uh, any dead chap, you know, he'd go and he always had a knife in his hand, he'd slit the wristbands on watches, you know, he's collecting watches. Some of them would go and take the rifle butts and knock the gold teeth out <laughs> for gold. I'm telling you, he did everything. <laughs> and, uh, but they died at their, he slid it to Ratch on the a, on a right jack and when he did all the maggots come out, you know, and that, that cured him. He didn't go for watches anymore. You <laughs> can see why. Well, we kept going down that valley and uh, we got down to, to the end of the town, you know, and the road went like this and then it made an L shape and you had to make a little turn and there was supposed to be a bridge there to go over and get on the other side. It was like, a, it was like a canyon, like uh, Watkins Glen or something like that. Not quite as wide, but deeper, you know. And it was only not too big a bridge. And that was the idea, you get up there before they could blow that bridge on us. That would have trapped us on the side. But at the same time, on the other side of the mountain ridge, we always had to wait for the other outfit to move up. So, you know, you couldn't be in all directions. You had to be in line. So, they sent a, a patrol up in front. There was a Jap truck that had been hit. And it just had sides on it. And they must have robbed the bank in Manila. They were loaded with silver dollar of pesos. And they blew all over the hillside. <laughs> so this patrol comes back carrying their helmets full of these silver pesos. <laughs> and everybody had pesos. And we went up and got a load of them, see? And, uh, that was, uh, when the card games, and when we got back, everybody had pesos, you know. Eventually they disappeared. They would sell them in, in Manila, that they used to pound them in the rings. And uh, we came back and we got the thing, and we had one guy, his name was Butler. And he always used to see things, you know. And it was like Peter and the Wolf, Cry Wolf. 
So one time in Bougainville, he thought he'd see a light on a mountain way down. We were up here and going that way, and he'd see a light down there. So they took him seriously, and they put us on barges and sent us down there, landing craft. And there was nothing down there. Well, the guys never let him forget it. <laughs> so he's sitting on these tank destroyer talking to these guys. And he says, hey, there's a jet tank up there, camouflaged up on the crest. Everybody, oh, butler. And there was. So the tank destroyer opens up. And sure enough, there was a tank up there. He hit it and blew the, the camouflage away. But there was two more tanks up there, right up, right by the side of them. So one of them started firing and he hit the, hit the one of them telephone poles next to the tank. See, we were supposed to be with the tank. But stretched out. Well, Cap, he stayed by the tank. And that shell, one of their shells, hit that damn thing and he got it in his, he got the shrapnel in his liver. They had to take him out. He came back later, but they took him out. Now I was over, Father. Good thing, because I, I, I always figured them tanks are also a good target. So we had our thing there, and then finally we decided we got over that bridge. And there was a stupid thing I did. So we went over the bridge and got up to the top, and there was another highway over there, and we were supposed to make contact with another outfit, and then we were going to be relieved, see. So there was a little trouble along the line, or I had to go out and search out something or something like that, because they chased them out of there. And I walked into this house to look, you know, and there's a house, here's a safe out there, you know, sitting right out in the yard. The safe locked up. But somebody else come along, you know, we didn't bother with souvenirs or anything. But I walked in the back of the house, and there was a cage with rabbits in one white rabbit. I should have left it in there, but I didn't. I figured, I don't know how long this thing's been here and ain't been fed, you know? I don't know how long the people are gone. So I let the rabbit out. He ran in the fields. Well, probably one of the GIs coming along later caught him and butchered him. <laughs> so we went up the line, made our contact, and then we were through, back around the corner, and slipped under a house. And then we went back for a rest for a while. Where did you pick up the sword and the, and the battle flag? Was that the lad there, the swords, see, we wouldn't, uh, nobody touched any, you know, when you're in the front line, you don't monkey with booby traps. Not to forget that. They would, the guys in the front lines were not collectors. It's just only like a guy with the watches, you know. Well, if you see a ring, you take a ring or something like that. But nothing else, you know, if it's on a body, it ain't booby trap. But don't grow the booby body over, because it can be booby trap too. So uh, then we came back and we went back into camp. And they brought up a whole truckload of these swords. Somebody was really saving. They figured, what the hell, these guys earned them, and they ain't getting nothing. Because these service companies and that come up behind and they're gathering them up and taking them down, getting $75 a piece back in Manila, you know, souvenirs. Even the Navy come up there one day, and he offered me $50 for mine, and I laughed at him. You know, I knew he was going to get a hundred and quarter for it back there. And, uh, he had one that he wanted to make a match in one, you know. And I lugged it around, brought it back home. That was the only, well, that and the flag is the only silver and I brought. The so that, the point was, who got what? So we drew numbers, and we stood there. And then you could run around the back of the building where they were all piled and take your pick. Well, the first one's got some Samaru swords, you know, them short ones like that. Well, they got the best of the pick, well, after a while it was pretty much the same. So uh, just take a sword and that was yours. The flag was the uh, same area? Or? No. I got the flag in, up in Baguio, or in Zigzag Road to Baguio. And uh, I got that from a Filipino, one of the guerrillas working with us, because they went somewhere and he came with back with the flag and he he, and he said, you want it, you know, so I took it. And uh, that's the only thing, because it's easy to carry a flag. Because mm -hmm. I, I went, uh, like I went there at, at that time at uh, the top of the world, you know, when I washed the blood off of me in the stream, and then I went back, there was a shack there, and it had a bamboo fence all around it, see, where they 
keep their animals in. And I walked in the gate. Some other GIs were coming around. I don't know where they're coming from. And I walked back in there, and in the middle of the courtyard, there was a wheelbarrow. And it was all a pile up with manila beer. But it was the stupidest thing. You could see the trip wires on it. I wouldn't touch that. So there was also sake, Japanese whiskey. And uh, I watched, you know. These other guys had taken bottles out of the case and nothing happened. So I went over and took a couple of bottles too. And I went back up, opened up the bottle, and laid in the slit trench, took a swig, that was enough for me. So I, I, a guy going by and I had two bottles, so I put the cap back on, oh, I gave the other guy a swig too. He didn't go for it much either. Oh, it burned. Tequila, but, uh, not tequila, uh, I don't know what the heck said. I think that's, uh, I forget what they call it now, it's a wine like, that. that's all right, it's made from a palm too. One of the other ones fermented and one ate. And uh, I put the cap on and I noticed here, guy from Mississippi in our outfit, Perkins, I says, he will drink anything. So I told this guy, give these two bottles to Perkins and tell, tell the squad it's on me because I was attached with the bazooka to another squad. And I don't know, they sucked them up. <laughs> then we could be a glass eye, holy man. Yeah, kind of hurt. I couldn't grow that stuff. Do you remember what the what the Brown Star action was? It's something to do with a machine gun. That's it was some kind of a machine gun deal. Yeah, but that happens a lot, you know. Yeah, it's just that the one that's half a single out. Yeah, well, I don't know if they fit. Maybe we had an officer around or something. You know, a lot of this stuff here, I can see this stuff, you know. You see these pictures, action pictures. Most of them are the, the, the headquarters company, the, you know, the uh, regiment headquarters or service companies. You can tell most of them are carrying carabines. You know, many of them carry rifles, see, because they're working day. Mm -hmm. And that's where these photographers are. They're not going way up. Very few of you ever get a one in the front. And where, do you remember where that was? The, where? Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so. I thought it was in there, but maybe I got the paper. You probably got your citation. I remember, I, remember, I remember reading it somewhere sometime. Yeah. Oh, I also, that I, well, I know where it is. It's a, it's a mimeograph paper, I think. And it's also with the one the Army gave us when we come out about how to act as civilians. You know, don't call butter axle grease and mm -hmm. <laughs> don't use your helmet, you know, for this and for that. How to behave in public. You just don't go over and stand alongside the building. <laughs> yeah. Did you, you ship back directly from the Philippines then to, to California? Huh? You shipped back directly from the Philippines? To yeah, California? well, we came back. You see, there was another thing. On that day, there, the day, Thanksgiving, I did. We were out in the, we were at that time, we were at uh, Cabana Taman. Yeah, Cabana Taman we went back to. We had already been there before. And this time we went back and there, that was our camp piece. And uh, they sent up turkeys, but there wasn't enough turkeys to go around. Remember they always used to say, you know, the politicians, the radio, there's turkey for every soldier and all that stuff. Well, they sent a turkey to a company. Now you got over 300 men, what are you going to do with one turkey? So they already had to strike our tents. There was boats coming in at, uh, uh, what the hell is it? I know the name, it's Craig, we were there. And, uh, I got malaria attack coming on. So I'm putting in adamant tablets, you know, because I don't want to get this, I'm not going to no medics. Because you go to the hospital, you're on the casualty list. If you're on the casualty list when you're all right, you go to the dock, if they got room, you maybe take 10, 12, fill up cots or something, you go home, if you don't, you go back to the camp and wait again until another boat comes. And this is the way you might be stranded for months. So I was gonna go on there and if I had crawl on. So I sat out on my bag, eating pork and beans for Thanksgiving. And we took our chick, a turkey, the company next to us wasn't gonna load, there wasn't a room in our boat for them. And ours was a small Dutch freighter and there was uh, two 
or these troop transports, they were passenger vessels before, in the harbor. So we get the Dutch freighter. They make the, the uh, showers on the deck out of tar paper shacks, you know? Mm -hmm. That was the showers. So the other part was just holes in the wall. And uh, the other two ships, they were fast, see? So they were gonna go ahead. Well, these other guys that had more points than I did, was our, from our company, but they were from other companies too. They took the points from high companies and put them in one outfit, see? They were gonna go home first, which was, they were in from, some of them guys were in from universal training. They never got home that year. It was about the end when the war broke out. So they never let them go home. So that's four or five years for some of them guys. Wow. So they went and they started up north, which we were gonna go and then up and I guess we we're gonna go to water on Washington way, you know, the upper route. But they run into a hurricane or typhoon up there. And they had to turn around and come back. So us, instead of going up, we went around the bottom uh, of Lewis Island between the San Mar and then come through. And then we were gonna go, and we went by Wake Island and then places. And uh, on this duck was small, it was a real big ship. It was a Dutch freighter one time. It was a Dutch ship. Dutch officers, uh, Javanese uh, mess crews, and Hindu crewmen, all mixed up in it. And these Javanese, even they had their tables, their, you know, planks mounted on pipe, that's all they were, and then a pipe with the plank on for a seat. They would put their rice, it seems like that's all they're ever eating, on the seat and sit on the floor, you know, and, and pick it up in their hand and shut it in their mouth. That's what they did. And every night, they got on, the Hindus got on the back of the boat and went to Mecca, you know, with their prayer card. And uh, so we had to go that way, and then we were supposed to go to Honolulu. Well, when we got near to Honolulu, they radioed in and said that there was no docking space to keep on going to the United States. So then we were gonna go to Los Angeles. Well, we went below Los Angeles called San Pedro, which is a fishing port town, you know? And that's where we came in. And then from there we took a train inland and it's right, little, there's a little, this side of it now, Riverside, that was the camp. And that camp, you're on your own. They put you in barracks, and that was it. They had loudspeakers on poles. And you listen to the name to be called, to go down to the railroad station. So you make sure you weren't gonna miss. Mm -hmm. You're afraid to go anywhere because you weren't gonna miss it. <laughs> Day and night. You got home just Whenever about. Whenever a train came in, then they called somebody and you got loaded. And you got home just about Christmas? Two hours. And from there on Riverside, waiting again and they start re-outfitting us. And you know that there, I blew my top again. I was blowing my top. Oh no, that was at Fort, uh, Fort Knox. Uh, we got shipped to Fort Knox. I wanted to go to Indian Town Gap, but I don't know, the 29th or what? They decreed that everybody on this side goes to 